Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm David Pepos, the writer of Spencer and Locke and Going to the Chapel over at Action Lab. And welcome to your Ringo Awards pre-show coverage. Uh, I'm excited to uh, kick off today's festivities with uh, Erica Schultz and Chris Campano, who have uh, a number of Ringo Award nominations between the two of them. Uh, welcome aboard, you guys. Congratulations on your nominations. How are you guys feeling today? Thank you. Thank, thank you. What's up? Um, so, yeah, I was going to say, so, Erica, I know you're involved in a number of uh, nominations, uh, Best Writer, uh, Best Series for Forgotten Home, um, some of your collaborators, Natasha Altarisi, uh, Marika Cresta, uh, Cardinal Ray, also nominated, um, and also uh, in Best Anthology for Strange Tales. Chris, you're nominated for Best Artist or Penciler, as well as Best Original Graphic Novel for The Adventures of Parker Reef. So, um, yeah, first off, how are you guys feeling with these nominations? You go first, Chris. Oh, um, I think it's it's uh, I don't know, it's kind of incredible. It just feels good to um, I, I promise I wouldn't say this, but it feels good to be uh, you know acknowledged in the industry. Yeah. You know, it's it's a lot of um, you know drawing and writing when nobody's paying attention, and then all of a sudden people pay attention. And although you say you do it for the love of it, I'd be lying if I if I said it wasn't nice to know that people were paying attention a little bit. Feels good. Erica, Erica, what about you? How, how are you? how are you feeling? Especially, I feel like you're kind of like Thanosing it with like all the uh, in, Infinity Gems of the nominations. Um, um, how, how does that feel to be uh, uh, sweeping the nominations so far? Um, I, I think it's, you know, it like Chris says, you know, you we're in comics because we love it. And being acknowledged is is a big deal. Um, it also gives me a little street cred with my students at the Kubert School. So I'm not like just the writing teacher. Now it's like, oh, she's the writing teacher and she's got a couple nominations. So it's like, yeah, now you really have to listen to me. <laughs> uh, so for those who, who aren't familiar with the books that are being nominated, um, Erica, can you tell us a little bit about Forgotten Home? And then Chris, can you tell us a little bit about The Adventures of Parker Reef? Um, Forgotten Home is urban fantasy story that is uh, Comixology Originals, and it takes place, um, it starts out in Montana, and there is a uh, sheriff's deputy named Lorraine Adelette who is uh, investigating a, a series of child kidnappings. Um, usually kids around between 10 and 12 are getting kidnapped, and there's no, it, there's no real pattern to it. Um, but we learn that Lorraine actually comes from another world. She's not human. And she goes to the crime scenes and uses her abilities, her magic, and realizes that people from her old world are kidnapping these kids. So she has to go back home and try and get these kids back. And she didn't exactly leave on the best of terms. Wow, that's, uh, that sounds really awesome. Chris, uh, what about you? Can you tell us, uh, what's the Adventures of Parker Reef about? Uh, okay. Um, so uh, Adventures of Parker Reef is a story about uh, a mother and son who pass away. And the son, 14 years later, wants to understand why uh, the father didn't come with them. So his adventure is to go from where they are and try to make it back to where, you know, the land of the living to ask his father that question. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, uh, it's like this adventure through like forgot, like this, like the realm of forgotten souls and um, the nothing. And uh, it's, it's this whole big thing to, uh, to get back. It's, it's about, uh, it's about family. You know, it, it, this has been very, uh, an unprecedented year as far as uh, the comics industry, as well as really kind of the world at large is concerned. And, uh, you know, uh, you can see just for the, the fact that we're doing this uh, event virtually, as opposed yeah. to uh, being in, in, in Baltimore. Uh, how have you guys been coping the last seven months? Um, how, you know, how have you guys uh, had to pivot as far as getting, uh, as, as far as your work and getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, awareness around your work, especially in a world when we're all still sitting at home? I gained about 12 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it works out there. Yeah. And that's, and that's, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm lucky in the sense that, you know, I, I was used to working from home uh, on a lot of projects, but the conventions being in person really do help getting your work out there and meeting new fans and getting a larger fan base. So even though things are uh, virtual and still, um, and still accessible for people, it, it, it is a little difficult. I think it's more difficult now to, you know, when you're at a convention, you can call somebody over to your table and talk to them and show them your work. Um, 
I think it's a little more difficult just being online because if someone's not already your follower or they don't see it through like somebody retweeting, then they're not going to know that this is, you know, out there. Right. Chris, how about you? Um, how, how, how have you been uh, handling things the last seven months? Well, for me, I mean, even though I have, you know, some credits with IDW or Dynamite and, and stuff like that, I'm really, you know, the industry probably knows me and I, I think of myself as an indie artist. So for me, the road and the shows and the hustle of the shows is kind of where I build my fan base and my audience and where I, I you know, I, I make my money for the most part. So it, it was a transition to really figure out how to turn, you know, being at home and working on indie stuff and, you know, some commissions, how to, how to turn that into uh, kind, of, kind of being on a show circuit. You know, whether it was a lot of live drawing or if it was having like a Campanicon every other weekend or something like that. It was like, it's, it's, I won't say that I, I don't like being home because I, I love being home and not being on the road as much, but I, I really miss uh, just the interaction, just the feel of, of being in a room with a lot of people who are, you know, we're into the same stuff and nothing else matters. And we're just kind of, you know, we're digging on the art and comics and all that and all those kinds of things. I guess social media has been the only way that, we've really been able to reach out and, and try to make the hustle still work. You know, I, I feel like everybody's got a different answer to this question, but where do you see the, the, the future of comics, you know, uh, especially sort of uh, as far as 2021 and 2022 are concerned, you know, how do you see it post pandemic? I think comics are, are, are due to for a big revival as far as, as far as kids and everybody getting back into it. I really think what we're, what we're learning a lot about, ourselves with this pandemic is we might need less than we thought we needed as far as like electronics and all these other things we might just need people and really good stories and things to keep us going and and those connections that can happen and and that love of of you know really good writing and, and really good art and and things around us that we can enjoy when we don't have the ability to enjoy a lot of other outside stimuli it could just be a really good book you know and i i think that Creators, although we took a big hit, like everybody else did, I think creators create, you know, no matter what. We could be depressed. We could be, I mean, Parker Reef came out of the loss of my girlfriend and my son, you know, so we create no matter what it is. And I think some of the best work you're going to see is going to come out of creators during this pandemic. And I think that'll bring people back. And I think people want things, you know, uh, want new things. I, I think it's going to get bigger. I think it'll be no longer, oh, that was a comic. I thought it was just a movie. I think it's going to be, you're going to see a lot of love for comics. Erica, what about you? Uh, no, I'm, I 100% agree what he's saying. Uh, this idea of like going back to, you know, the core of a good story, you know, um, there's a lot of like flash, you know, and a lot of, you know, well, I, Nothing against the man, but what I like to say is like Michael Bay film were just like explosions everywhere kind of thing, popcorn film kind of thing. There's a lot of stories out there and that's fine. Like that is that is what it is. But I think coming back to a simple, solid core story that has characters that the audience can really um, gravitate toward, can really root for, can really feel a connection to, I think that's important. And like Chris said, you know, going back to sort of like this idea of we don't need as much as we th we thought we did. You know, we can survive on not I'm not going to say the bare minimum, but we can survive on a lot less than we had. And and this is a big lesson, I think, for for everybody. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, creators, we are going to find a way out of it. We'll find a way because we're going to focus our energy into making new stories, into telling new you know, whether it's with characters that they we've already written about or somebody else, but making new stories and making new inroads because that's what we do to survive, you know? Yeah. Lightning round before I, I, I have to switch <laughs> to our next guest. Um, what's next on your agenda, you guys? Uh, what, what, what do you guys have coming down the pike next? Um, I have the Legacy of Mandrake. Uh, issue number one comes out uh, actually this Wednesday, this new comic book day, uh, new comic book day coming this Wednesday, the 28th. And uh, the zero issue is already up on Comixology and it is for free. So you can read Legacy of Mandrake for free, uh, zero issue. Nice. Chris, what about you? Uh, I've got Parker 2, which is behind me. Nice. 
Um, I have a couple of more covers lined up. I can say that I have one more Turtles cover coming, but I can't say what issue it is. And um, there's something I'm working on with the writer Garrett Gunn called Call the Ravens Home, which is like a Norse mythology book. And uh, and the hustle. You never know what next email is going to be. Yeah. You know? Well, Erica, Chris, thank you guys so much for, for spending uh, some time with me at the Ringo's pre-show uh, today. Uh, we've got Ryland Grant uh, in, in the background, so let's uh, let's bring him up. Ryland, buddy, how you doing? Howdy, howdy. how you doing? Good man? morning. I know it's uh, bright and early for the both of us. Um, uh, so, yeah, still getting up to speed. The uh, you know my my four year old had me up at about six a.m., so I'm I'm running at half speed still. I feel it, Ryland. You you've got a lot going on right now. Not only are you involved uh, with four different Ringo Award nominations, uh, best series for Banjax, as well as best cover artist, best colors, best letter for your team on Banjax, but you're also in the middle of a Kickstarter uh, for oh, wow, the yeah. Peacekeepers. Um, so yeah, uh, first off, how, how are you feeling having so much going on for you at once? Uh, you know, it's, um, uh, being busy is good, particularly now, you know, idle hands and all that. Um, yeah. it, it just amounts to a lot of opportunity and, um, you know, it's all good news. Uh, you know, people are digging the Kickstarter. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, how do you, uh, how do you take issue with, uh, four Ringo nominations? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so for those who, who uh, aren't uh, familiar with the series, tell us a little bit about Banjax and tell us a little bit about the Peacekeepers. Yeah, well, Banjax is, um, uh, God, it can easily be described as kind of Death Wish with a superhero. Um, you have a, uh, a, a disgraced former superhero, kind of a, a hard-nosed Batman type, um, who finds out he has terminal cancer caused by using his powers. The irony of the situation is, uh, in his mind, is that um, defending what he has deemed an ungrateful and unworthy city is now literally killing him. Um, and so he takes a long look at his legacy. Um, he's got three months to live. The city is still a cesspool. Um, he decides he ain't going out like that. And he decides he's going to use kind of every last breath he has uh, to kind of purge the city of, of villains before he he dies. Um, it's a two-hander. Uh, uh, what's going on at the same time is that kind of the Robin to his Batman uh, is kind of this guy who became the point and wink superhero ideal, uh, uh, you know, once he was kind of moved out of the way. And uh, this protege is now charged with bringing his old mentor in. Um, the problem is he's not remotely up to it. And so over the course of the series, he kind of has to, you know, become a man, become an actual hero. Um, and it's a, it's a badass ride, man. I mean, it's a, every issue is a punch in the face, a punch in the gut, a punch, you know, wherever else, uh, hurts. <laughs> um, and, um, I just let loose on it, you know, um, embraced all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, uh, crazy, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, different points of view, um, uh, unreliable narrators, uh, experimental elements. The the second issue is told from the point of view of a man who hasn't slept in seven days, and, and he's being driven mad by it. And um, so reality is kind of starting to bend around him. You don't know what's real and what isn't. Um, sure. It's fun. Yeah. I definitely know that feeling about a uh, reality bending all around us for lack of sleep. <laughs> uh, so, you, you know, I, I, it's one of those things. Um, you, you, you're... You, you 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 even list yourself in your books as as a director slash writer, and um, I know that you are very hands on as far as uh, assembling your teams and the fact that your entire Banjax team has been nominated for Ringo Awards this year. Uh, how does that make you feel? Um, how did you kind of uh, connect with these uh, with with your team, and how do you feel uh, knowing that they've all been uh, uh, nominated for the big awards tonight? It was a huge deal, and um, and uh, yeah. So you know, l last year my my book aberrant, my my last book aberrant um, was it was nominated for two Ringos, and then we won another one. We we won uh, we won best villain, uh, and then we were nominated for best single issue and best writer. And uh, and uh, you know, the best single issue, uh, best writer. You know, a lot of a lot of people were like, oh, you're nominated, you're nominated, you're nominated. But I had this great team. Who you know? I mean, obviously, they had a lot to do with the uh, the best um, the best single issue nomination and, and the best villain nomination, um, and then of course making me look good as a writer. But I felt like they didn't get the praise that they deserved the last go round, um, sure. and that bothered me. And so my um, my mission this go round uh, was to make sure that they got you know the, their due, and um, and it's well deserved. I mean, the art is just gorgeous. 
Um, and, and, you know, they, um, they carried me on their backs with this one. And so, um, so yeah, it's, uh, uh, you know, Fabio Alves, um, and Edson Ferreira, who are this amazing, uh, Brazilian team who, um, you know, will be drawing Marvel books in a couple of years. Um, and HDE, who was a, a letter in the UK, who, um, he letters all my books. He lettered Aberrant and, uh, and, you know, I have about four other titles in the pipe. Um, and, uh, and he, you know, he's lettered all of those. He, and he's lettered the Peacekeepers, which is on Kickstarter now. So, uh, you know, it, it, this has been a crazy year, uh, both in terms of the comics industry and kind of the world around us. And I wanted to ask, um, you know, normally we'd be doing this show at Baltimore. We'd be hanging out uh, over there. Um, the fact is, is that we're all kind of is staying put at home. How have you kind of changed the way that you do business this year? Um, how, how have you had to pivot in the fact that we're, you know, there's no comics conventions and that the industry itself is kind of contracted a little bit? Yeah, well, it, it you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's been felt by me doubly because, you know, my day job is I write, uh, you know, movies and TV shows, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, big action movies that, you know, Erica is so fond of. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so, um, yeah, so my business, uh, both of both of these businesses, my comics business and my movie TV business has pivoted uh, like crazy. I mean, it's, um, I am on, you know, a Zoom meeting, I don't know, probably for you know, half the day now, uh, a producer, a writer. And, and the, the thing is, you know, the odd thing is that it has kind of put a lot of time back into my day because LA is this massive place and the traffic is horrendous. And so it, normally I'd have to go, you know, to a, a film meeting and I would spend an hour in the car each way. Now I just kind of, uh, you know, I step away from my daughter for a minute. I fire up Zoom. I, I, I knock the meeting out. Um, in terms of the comic stuff, um, we have all found ways to cope. I mean, there, there have, um, I mean, I, I desperately miss cons and I desperately miss the, the interaction, but, um, you know, there are great online cons. Uh, the guys doing this con did a couple of cons called the mainframe comic con that were just stellar. And, you know, I helped wherever I could organizing them. And, um, and so there have been, you know, those sort of approximations. Um, uh, David Avaloni and I started doing a, a, a podcast called The Writer's Block that we're actually doing later today at 5 p.m. on this feed, 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, the, the thing that, that we missed more than anything uh, about the con experience was sort of the after party, you know, they call it bar con or whatever, uh, where, you know, you, you work the floor the whole day and then we creators would kind of get together afterwards, go across the street and kind of shoot the shit at a bar. And so our podcast is, you know, it's about an hour of, uh, of, you know, creators just kind of sitting around and it sort of starts out with us talking about the state of the business and what's going on, but then it usually ends up degenerating to us arguing about uh, old Star Trek episodes. And so um, we're doing that later today with, with you, of course, and with, uh, Stan Sakai, who's like a personal hero of mine, and and, um, and Troy Little, and uh, a few other people are going to pop in, so it's going to be good. Yeah, uh, no, I'm very excited for 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 doing that later today. So thank you for inviting me, uh, because yeah, also a huge Stan Sakai fan, and uh, I'm a little bit of a Rylan Grant and David Avalone fan myself. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, I guess um, you know what's what's next for you. I mean, what do you have coming uh, down down the down the pike? I know you've got a Kickstarter running, the Peacekeepers. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, the 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 first thing is the Peacekeepers, of course. That that is uh, that's on Kickstarter right now. You can go to Kickstarter and search the Peacekeepers. You can search my name, or or you can go to uh, bit.ly backslash the Peacekeepers. And that is, it's a story that I've wanted to write for 15 years, but kind of couldn't, couldn't, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hollywood doesn't let you do a lot of different stories right now. And, and, you know, comics is a crazy game, but, um, finally found a way to put my dream project, uh, uh, you know, in book form. Uh, and it's wonderful. It is a, a love letter to, um, uh, you know, dark and decidedly quirky, um, uh, uh, crime dramas like Fargo, or No Country for Old Men. Um, so if you love those films, if you love case of season police dramas like True Detective or The Wire, if you dig Elmore Leonard novels like I do, and if you are a fan of co comic masterpieces like Criminal or 100 Bullets, you're gonna love this thing. Um, and so uh, so the first two issues are available right now on Kickstarter. Um, and that's that's kind of a, a, a runaway train right now. I've been really enjoying that ride. So um, go check that out, definitely. And um, yeah, as I alluded to before, I have a, I, you know, I have like four other titles in the pipe um, and, and they're coming and they're coming fast and they're coming strong. I think like everybody um, that's in this game, um, you know, kind of hit a big speed bump. Um, I had uh, I had two titles that were, were pretty much set to, um, 
you know, be announced, released with big publishers. And then, um, you know, and then COVID hit and, uh, and it was pencils down and, um, you know, there were a lot of, uh, you know, layoffs and firings, unfortunately, and um, everything kind of got thrown in, in, into, uh, you know, into, to question. Um, sure. And so now um, just sort of starting to pick up all the pieces on those. I mean, it looks like, uh, looks like we have a publisher for one of those titles. Um, nice. And uh, so, you know, I got a lot of work uh and it's I, I think it's a lot of good work you know the last two books were uh were nominated uh at these Ringo awards and so um so yeah if you're a publisher out there and you know you're looking for some some hard-working folks uh give us a call we we got some good material for you where do you see uh where do you see the industry going next post uh post pandemic Wow, that's a that's a big question. I'm going to try not to take up uh, uh, all the time on this feed, but um, you know, it's it's we have necessarily had to change, and I think we've already done a very good job of changing. Um, uh, you know, um, I've talked about this on the podcast before. I mean, I think that, and you know, the problem is that there is less mainstream opportunity for guys like you and I right now, and that may change. Um, you know. Uh, publishers have had to really protect themselves, right? I mean, it's a hard go for them. And so they've, uh, they've had to pare back slates and, uh, you know, uh, uh, just fewer spots on those publisher benches and stuff like that. But I think that we're entering this era of creator empowerment, you know? We saw a similar thing in the NBA uh, for about the last 10 years where, you know, guys like LeBron James and Kawhi Leonard and Kevin Durant, they kind of wrestled control away from the owners and they started deciding where they play and who they play with. And, you um, you know, I think that we're seeing the same thing in comics with creators. Um, you and I, we used to have to wait for permission from a, a big time publisher to be able to do our books. Um, but there's so much other opportunity uh, out there right now that we no longer have to. I mean, um, uh, I, I, I did it with the jump on Kickstarter and I'm doing it again with Peacekeepers. And you did it recently with the OZ, which was just an incredible book and this runaway success on, uh, on, on Kickstarter. And, you know, um, if we have a book that we want to make, we no longer have to wait for permission. We no longer, you know, have to wait for a publisher's blessing. We can kind of go out, make our own book, take it directly to the consumer um, uh, via sites like Kickstarter. And, and you know, and we can make a little money, uh, which which is kind of rare in this business, all too rare. Um, and, and you know, we can get, uh, you know, some incredible recognition. We can find an audience. And, and you know, I guess the irony of the whole situation is that, you um, you do well on Kickstarter and then the publishers start, you know, banging on your door. Right. Um, and, and so, and so all of that traditional public publishing success comes because you kind of decided, well, I don't need that right now. Um, and, and, and we're, we're seeing it happen. You know, there are the peons like you that are doing it, but then, you know, Scott <laughs> Snyder is, is, is going to pick, you know, he made $218,000 on Kickstarter. Uh, uh, um, Kevin Eastman, you know, uh, made 125 grand a couple of times. Uh, Keanu just made 1.5 million on Kickstarter. And so you're seeing even like the big dogs go to Kickstarter and, and sites like that because uh, it's a better deal in a lot of ways, you know, um, but, but then, but then they move on and they have this second massive success in traditional publishing. And Ends up kind of being the best of both worlds, and it actually ends up helping uh, the the publishing machine. Where you know, I, I think that these two these two uh, uh, machines they used to be at odds with each other, um, and I feel like it's all been accelerated because of this COVID thing. They've kind of made friends with each other, and they're they're living in this wonderful harmony. One is feeding off the other in this great way, and and you've seen publishers like Boom, like Scout, really kind of embrace this model. Um, uh, and it's helped everybody. It's helped, you know, it's, it's helped the publishers, it's helped Kickstarter, it's helped guys like you and I, it's certainly helped Keanu and, and Kevin <laughs> and Scott. Uh, uh, and, and I think it's wonderful. And so I think you're gonna, um, you know, it is a, it is a bold and brave new world right now. And I think you're going to see a lot more of this, um, uh, moving forward. Ryland, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us this morning. I'm excited to hop on the writer's block with you uh, later today. Um, if you haven't checked out his work on Banjax, if you haven't backed the Peacekeepers, please do so now. Um, I've got uh, waiting for us Eric Palicki, Joe Corallo, and Tyler Chin Tanner, uh, the masterminds behind uh, uh, the best anthology nominated, uh, Deadbeats. Uh, so, fellas, thank you so much for joining me. Um, how are you guys feeling uh, with this nomination? Looks good. It's nice to be nominated. Yeah, you guys feeling good about it? It's just good. nice to be asked. 
<laughs> <laughs> for those who haven't read the Deadbeats anthology, uh, fill, fill, fill them in. Uh, uh, give, give, give the quick pitch as, as to what this very unique and excellent anthology is all about. Um, who wants to do that? I think it should be one of you guys. I think it should be Joe. Okay, Joe. You. I think I think I should get coffee. But um, no, it's uh, it's a musical themed horror anthology. It's a it's a little bit of a throwback. We uh, you know we wanted to do uh, something that was horror that was also fun. So uh, we created this uh, shopkeeper character who runs a haunted record store. And uh, yeah, they sell instruments and other stuff. A lot of stuff you really shouldn't sell because it turns out it's uh, haunted or cursed. And um, you know, so she regales us with stories about uh, stupid people that got cursed haunted things. I love it. I love it. I feel like you you guys had a story. What was it? It was the cursed saxophone of, of Scott Sferatu. Yes. Uh, that, 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 that's probably an all great, uh, all time great title. Um, uh, so, so uh, kudos to you guys. Can you talk a little bit about the process of sort of getting this murderer's row of talent that you assembled for this book? Um, because I, I know you guys, especially, um, uh, you know, you, you guys have really staked out a nice claim on sort of these prestige anthologies. Um, so, so talk a little bit about how you brought uh, such a wide variety of, of artists and writers and creators together. Well, Ryland, who you just had on, talked at length about Barcon, right? And about sort of, you know, the working the floor all day and then working the bar all night at conventions, which is, you know, something that I think we've all really missed in 2020. But, uh, you know, you do that for a decade or so and you you meet a lot of people, you make a lot of friends, you you uh, your Rolodex fills up. And, and when the opportunity to do these anthologies comes up, it's uh, it's just a matter of you know, scrolling through that list of names and figuring out uh, who's a good fit for what project. Yeah, and we like to get a good mix of um, people who've been in the industry for a little while and some newer talent who maybe aren't super green but have been doing their own thing, uh, a little more independent, mi mix that up a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Tyler, I was actually going to ask you because, okay. you know, a, a Wave Blue World feels like uh, a, a, a real um, incubator for these amazing anthologies. You've been doing so many of them. And I was curious, um, you know, a lot of publishers kind of steer away from that. And I, yeah. I was I was curious, what made you lean towards saying, we're going to make a Wave Blue World a place that we can, we can do these amazing anthologies? Yeah, it's one of the things that we take on uh, each year to do one or two anthologies as well as a few creator-owned or in-house stuff. Um, I, mostly just because they're fun. Kickstarter makes it easier. You get a lot of people together. It's almost just for that event itself, you know? I mean, it's nice to have these in our back catalog and everything, but just the, the Kickstarter and the direct to fans and, and then get it into shops. It, it's just a lot of fun. It's what where comics are kind of going in terms of Kickstarter, digital platforms, uh, doing things like this online, connecting with people all over the world uh, through new technology. It just seems to work really well. We enjoy it. Um, so we're just keeping doing it. As, as long as the demand's still there, people are happy for it, which it seems to be each Kickstarter. You kind of have to be like, all right, I hope everybody's down for another one. <laughs> sure. Um, but it's been, a, been positive feedback. So as long as people are enjoying it, creators, are enjoying being part of it, uh, we'll keep doing it. I'd also like to add that um, since Tyler started doing a lot of these anthologies, we, we've we noticed DC is doing a lot more anthologies lately too. <laughs> and I'm not saying that uh, they got the idea from Tyler, but look at the timeline. I think DC's just been copying me since I got started, you know? <laughs> All of their business plan after. Uh, you know. Not to make anybody choose between their babies, but were there any stories in the Deadbeats anthology that you particular that particularly stood out to you that you either thought this is an amazing concept or this is a hilarious concept or this is just I'm jealous that somebody else came up with this concept? Mm. <laughs> you, know, you got you got an idea? Yeah, um, I, I mean, there's there's so many. I, I mean. Um... One of the things that that was nice that um, it, you know stood out was being able to like reunite Rachel Pollock, Richard Case, oh, yeah. and uh, John Workman, all three who who had worked on Doom Patrol together. So so to get all of them back 
um, for the first time, and it was like 26 years wow. since we all worked together. Um, it was was kind of a you know a, a highlight. Yeah, it's historic, and it's a way for me to answer this question in a way that people <laughs> can't really push back against. Mm -hmm. And it's like it's not really copping out, but I'm totally copping out. I I you know what I will I'll 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 bite the bullet here. Uh, <laughs> I think the story that really excited me, uh, especially during the you know the script review and editing process was uh trace dean and and tyler Claudfelter's uh hey darling do you gamble mm -hmm. uh, those are both names that i think in the next couple of years we'll be hearing a lot more from both of them and it was really cool to give them this platform yeah that was a good one yeah there's yeah, a lot of them uh gold dust woman was fun not just to pick one out again like yeah. i'm not saying one's better than the other regine sawyer yeah, sure. and sanders and then we did an animation there's a uh, um, a pole dancing, uh, this thing right here, yeah, which was fun. So that was really neat too. That stood out as being unique, but they were they were also good. I mean, there there was oh, yeah. a bad note in this whole oh. section. Oh yeah, and uh, I, I really liked. I thought like in, in terms of like a, a different kind of story in the book, um, what Danny Lore and Marie Anger did mm -hmm. in uh, in their Apocalypse demo, it was probably one of the more like uh, atmospheric mm -hmm. kind of horror stories in, in the book in terms of like you know it was a little more like uh you know escape from new york than like uh a, a typical sort of <laughs> right. like uh horror story and uh you know you know that was that was nice to to have in the book yeah it's kind of one of the nice things about about anthologies like this is you you give people a theme whether it's horror or mm -hmm. you know with our some of our other anthologies some of the the broad science fiction themes and people sort of approach those themes from such oblique angles. And it's really cool to see the the, the spectrum of, of stories that come out of, of anthologies like this. Yeah, we had like multiple like romance stories in this, uh, yeah. you know, musical themed horror. Right. Book. And, and a couple that like, just like genuinely like pulled at your heartstrings, which I don't think people necessarily expected when they picked up this book, which is great. Curious. Uh, uh, what's 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 you guys' favorite horror movies? So this is this is uh, uh, you know a little bit of uh, pe people argue with me on this, but my favorite horror movie is is Silence of the Lambs. Some people will tell me it's not a horror movie, but uh, you know people get eaten in that movie, so I feel <laughs> like it counts. Yeah, people say the same thing to me about Pee Wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> but um my god I, I have a few all-time favorites uh suspiria uh, mm -hmm. and i also really like the remake um I, I know uh some people are divided on that but i really like both a lot um the first halloween movie uh one of the best slashes of all time as part of like the worst slasher franchise of all time um no the you, first you know, one that's the one that rob zombie directed right yeah, that's the the first one is the Rob Zombie uh, directed. Yeah, and then <laughs> um, you know, and then I just really liked uh, some some recent stuff too, like The Witch. I, I thought was excellent. Um, I, I'll I'll always go back to something like The Shining. You know, I, I watched that probably when I was too young and uh, still enjoy it. Uh, the first Alien, uh, Psycho, uh, are all uh, favorites of mine. Yeah, I don't know. I have too much to add to that. Uh, Get Out was really good. That was a recent one. Um, I'm not like a super classic horror person. I mean, if it's, a, if it's a, I hear it's a good movie, I'll go see it. Yeah, right. Um, so you know, it, it's been a crazy year as mm -hmm. far as the comics industry is concerned, as far as, far as the world is concerned. And uh, you know, normally we'd be doing this, we'd be hanging out at a bar at, at Baltimore right now. Mm -hmm. um, so how have you guys had to change the way you do business this year? Um, since everybody's staying at home, since, you know, there's been no cons, since, it, it, you know, we've had, you know, industry contractions, like even the the, the temporary diamond shutdown. Um, mm -hmm. How have you had to pivot this year to, uh, you know, sort of make things work? I don't know that we pivoted too much. I and mean, we definitely took a pause and we're like, okay, things are getting a little uh, crazy. Um, you know, and so we sort of took, uh, took our time, restructured things, just uh, priorities, you know, what what do we really need to, to spend money on? Um, 
to try trying to, I wouldn't say we increase social media too much, but there's a little more focus on that. Um, direct sales through our website have been really good because we've all, as long as the post office has been working and, and let's hope they stay working and the rates are good, then people can order from the website and I can send it out to them. <laughs> um, more stores, newsletters, things like that, things you can do virtually. But other than that, we're, we're a pretty small outfit, so it hasn't been that difficult for us to be like, all right, let's not go crazy. Let's just take some time to relax, make sure all our creators are taking care of themselves. But for the most part, we just kept working. Some deadlines were pushed, but, you know, we just try to make do and and uh, set ourselves up for what, whatever next year is going to be. Big, big question mark. Hopefully we're moving in the right direction. But, uh, yeah, just, just keeping busy. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know, um, first off, I know, Joe, you just announced uh, you're co-writing uh, a story over at TKO. And Eric, I know you've got a, a, a book uh, uh, that's being released over at Scout, uh, Atlantis Wasn't Built for Tourists. Can you guys talk a little bit, just, you know, tell us, for those who haven't, aren't aware of these books, tell us a little bit about them and, and uh, where people can, can order them from. Why don't you go first, Joe? Fine. Okay. All right. I'll, uh, <laughs> now, um, you can uh, pre-order uh, this. The, I, I, uh, what was it? It's Seeds of Eden. It's uh, TKO Shorts number one that I co-wrote with uh, Liana. Um, you, you know, we had been wanting to do more stuff together after she said Destroy, and this ended up being a great opportunity for that. And um, it's a sci-fi story. Uh, you know, it's very, like, 70s sci-fi horror influence. Uh, Paul Azaketa does the art for it and the colors, and uh, it's uh, we're we're really happy with how it came out. It's a 14 page story, and you can uh, pre order on TKO's site uh, the uh, number one uh, short, and there's a few other shorts as well uh, available. Yeah, they're two ninety nine. Um, I think they start shipping like next month, like middle of next month. So. So yeah, absolutely uh, check it out. Um, I'm a fan. I'm a little biased, but I liked it. So I enjoyed it too. Well, thank Leanna you. Leanna and Joe gave me an early peek, and it's great. Mm -hmm. I, I um, guess I'm the one waiting here. So I didn't so. get it one either, Joe. All right. <laughs> I'll, uh, yeah. I'll Eric, tell, tell us about uh, Atlantis Wasn't Built for Tourists. Sure, Atlantis Wasn't Built for Tourists is uh, just sort of a, a, a grindhouse action horror story set in... Uh, the Pacific Northwest wilderness. Uh, it's uh, I, I sort of uh, elevator pitch it as as it's Lovecraft meets Leone. Um, mm -hmm. It's about a, a stranger who wanders into a small town where all is not as it seems. Uh, the first two issues are out now, uh, available at your LCS uh, from Scout Comics. It's uh, gotten uh, you know solid reviews, and it'll be monthly. So issue three will be out in November, and the final issue will be out in December. Nice, nice. And Tyler, what's you know, uh, is there anything cool from a, a Wave Blue world that uh, people should should be knowing about that's, yeah, that's well, coming down the pike? Oh well, we just had three books come out or about to come out um, mm -hmm. these next few weeks. So the Phantom of the Opera adaptation was really neat. Hungarian artist uh, drew that. Uh, we reissued American Terrorist for its uh, tenth anniversary, first time in print and color, which is great to see. That's coming out this upcoming week. Um, and then we have another anthology. I don't know if you saw uh, Maybe Someday uh, was the one that we kickstarted this year and that's coming out the week of November 4th. So that'll be out and that's a lot of fun. And then that week, once those three books are out, we're gonna announce our Spring 21. Uh, I have eight titles planned for, uh, uh, I almost said 19, so old I am, 2021. Um, that, that we're really happy about and we're going to announce the spring ones after that so can't tell you anything yet but, but you'll see those coming up well fellas thank you so much for taking the time to chat with this uh, uh ringo awards pre-show um we've got uh steven scott and justin eisinger uh in in the background uh for uh they called us enemy uh so uh fellas thank you so much for 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 joining us um how are you guys feeling you guys are nominated for uh best uh, uh, nonfiction comic work. Uh, how does that feel? Steven, take it away. Yeah, it's uh, this is my first Ringo nomination. And so, yeah, I couldn't be more proud to be nominated for this particular project. So, uh, yeah, it's an incredible honor. 
I feel like every year there is a book that, you know, you, you see it popping up on all the awards categories and all the lists. Uh, you know, a few years ago, it was uh, uh, my favorite thing is Monsters. I feel like They Call This Enemy is that book for this year. Um, did you guys ever really anticipate that this, the, the, the kind of reception you would be getting for this book when you guys started working on it? I like to think that we recognize the potential for the story to resonate, right? And um, in a world where, where so many people are reading nonfiction graphic novels and the medium itself presents so much power, such a great tool for explaining complicated emotions and building sort of, you know, empathetic moments where you may not expect them. You know, uh, all I can say is that you know we 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 really believe that George's story is so important that it would resonate with with an audience that might not have been aware of it yet, and then all sorts of things in the real world continued to develop that only made the story that much more important and immediate to to share and how it you know resonates with the real world today. Yeah, we we did get a lot of feedback from people who would come through lines for the signings, um, noting to us how unfortunately timely the material was. And at the time we were we started it, it you know it was just around the time of the last election, and so it wasn't quite as timely as it became. But as we were writing it, it gradually became more so, and so we started to draw those parallels to what was happening during World War II and what we were seeing today. Now, uh, you know, for for those who haven't read, uh, they call this enemy. You know, uh, uh, graphic memoir uh, from George Takei, um, sort of, you know, about his 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 childhood. Um, and I I wanted to ask, what was the development process behind that? I mean, um, was it a matter of you guys approached George, George approached you? How did you guys wind up kind of uh, uh, hooking up, and then then sort of building out this story and and this team for uh, for a graphic novel format? Thanks, David. That, that's a great question, and it's one we've we've had the good fortune to address a few times. Um, you know, I, IDW and Top Shelf Publishing were the are the home of the March trilogy, and so as publishers, and at the time, oh, I still work with IDW Publishing, and, and Stephen was working there as well at the time when this book's development sort of just just sort of began to gesticulate. And um, one of the driving factors was again, like I mentioned earlier, just just recognizing that very important historical stories. Were, were very well suited to graphic novels. And with, with that thinking in mind, I, maybe one day I might, might have heard George's TED talk again or seen another story about him in the news and it, and it sort of clicked and it was like, George Takei has been telling this story for as long as I can remember. He's very passionate about it. I have a feeling he might be interested in telling the story in a different medium. Sure. Uh, through that rec recognition, through good fortune and, and just further kismet of the universe, let's call it, uh, Stephen Scott can jump in here and tell us a story about how that sort of went from being a pie in the sky idea to the book that you've, we've, you know, we all have seen now and hold in our hands. Stephen, take it away. Uh, yeah. So the origins of how they call this enemy came to be actually began um, in 2016 on the floor of New York Comic Con. Justin and I just happened to be in the booth together. We were chatting. He had mentioned in a previous meeting that we had been in together about. Um, the power of March and what is the next March because book three had just been wrapping up and and he mentioned the George Takei experience or at least the TED talk that George had given about his experience in the internment and so he said I think that would be a great story to tell I think that should be the next thing we tackle in this vein and so I had previous experience working with George um, during my time at Archie he had guest starred in an issue of Kevin Keller. And so through that experience and getting to know George and his husband, Brad, and having just a wonderful working relationship, I said to Justin, hey, well, I know George, maybe I could reach out and see if they're interested. As it turns out, he was. Uh, and, and oh, go ahead, David, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say from, from there, it became a matter of uh, finding out that George was, in, was interested in, in using the, 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 the medium. And then as and sort, of, sort of throughout the development process, um, we were talking to the other creators and sort of looking at who was going to tackle the story. And at some point, George it sort of became that, well, that we knew the story that we wanted to tell. And George said, well, you know, this, this is the team, which we were honored and blessed. And, and then, then, the hard, then, then the next hardest part was finding, you know, the artist. And unfortunately, Harmony Becker is not here to join us this morning. But uh, our, our fantastic editor, Lee Walton, and sort of marketing director for Top Shelf Comics was at, I believe, TCAF. Uh, walking the the artist alleys and found you know just recognized some 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 art style that he thought was really 
strong and, and really kind of captured what, what we'd all been talking about looking for to tell this story, which we recognized was difficult, right? It's a really heavy, serious story. It's about sort of a five-year-old child's perspective of that. We also knew we were gonna have a ton of cross-cutting with historic scenes that sort of put you right as a fly in the wall where these uh, angry white men were making angry decisions that were sort of punitive against another uh, ethnicity of people, which is a terrible history that, that we're all a part of still, right? Yeah. And uh, and Harmony did that. She had that immediately. And her, you know, people call it manga influenced and she say the same thing. She's a very manga influenced artist. She was able to take some of our first pages that we had written or some of our sample, we were calling sort of the sample pages and, and and suddenly whip them into shape. And I think those ended up being the first pages in the book, which is the scene sort of in the in, L in LA where uh, the, the army shows up at their house and wakes them up on that fateful morning in 1942. What was, uh, what was the research uh, process behind this? I mean, uh, you know, how much back and forth were you having with George? How much uh, extra research did you have to do sort of outside of his particular story? Um, you know, what, what was the process of just kind of taking this, you know, kind of, heartbreaking story and translating it in, in into a narrative script. Stephen, well, go for it. Sure. Um, well, as a writer yourself, David, I'm sure you can relate to this when anytime you start a new writing project, there's so much research involved, right? Whether it's yeah. fiction or in the, this case, nonfiction. And so we started by delving into George's autobiography from 94, it's called To the Stars. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that material is in the graphic novel. A lot of the stories he describes about his experiences, the memories that he has um, during internment, both good and bad. And right. so we adapted some of that material. We threw some new material in there just from conversations we had with him. A lot of uh, phone con calls were had where we would just basically take the word straight out of his mouth um, on the call and use that to narrate the book. And so... Um, not only that, but just like hearing his firsthand accounts, but a lot of research into what was happening in the world at that time in our country, um, in politics and policy and social atmosphere, you know, how the reaction towards Japanese Americans. So there was an immense amount of research involved, more research than I've ever had to do for anything. And it, honestly, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this as well. Sometimes writing can be fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> this project was not particularly fun, but it was mm -hmm. immensely rewarding, sure. um, especially hearing from all these young people recently who have actually read the book and asking questions that we were able to give feedback on. It's just, um, you know, such an important story to tell. So I'm so thrilled that George trust entrusted us to help tell that story that he's been telling and put it in this format that more people can can absorb the material and hopefully it'll have an impact on them the way it did on me when I um, wrote it. Right. Were, were there any moments in the process of making this book that surprised you? Um, or anything that you discovered in the research that really surprised you? I'd like to start, yeah, I'd like to start there real quick, David, and, and add this little, this nuance, which ties in with what Stephen said, and I think the question you just asked. Yeah. So, so speaking of the research and, and surprises, so I, I one of the, the key things I, I was interested about going into the story was how do so many good citizens let something terrible happen? Right? How, how do well-meaning people just let things around them happen that we all find individually usually unconscionable? And so I was, I was online doing a lot of research about 1920s Europe, sort of researching about sort of the, the climate in Europe uh, pre-World you know World War II so, or just before everything really broke off in Europe. And meanwhile, I'm listening to the news in the background and I started to, to realize that what I was sort of reading about online describing was what we were already living through in 2016, 2017 United States. And so one of the surprising realizations while we were working on the book was realizing that we were living through a history that I know that we couldn't fully understand, but that something was happening now. And that our, our book was sort of addressing it in a very metaphoric or, you know, in a, in a distant way, but was still very much talking about what was, I was, we were all living through in the moment. And that was sort of an unusual feeling to, to, to grapple with. It was like Stephen said, it wasn't exactly a fun book to sit down and write, work on. You wouldn't, sit down and be excited to write new pages because often you were dealing with really terribly sad, tragic moments that we were having to relive and figure out how to most bring to life on a page. And so there was a lot of emotional uh, toil and, and expense uh, in, in, in making that happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this series was, as you said, it, it started from a what's next 
conversation. Um, you'd said that, you know, what's the next March? And I guess, you know, the, the, the question I have for you guys, what's next for you guys? Um, I mean, you guys have, have uh, I think, taken a well-deserved victory lap uh, for They Called Us Enemy. Um, is there anything else coming down the, 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 the pike that you guys can talk about that you're working on next? I'm sure Steven has a lot of projects he's working on that he can talk about next. I'm working on several projects that I unfortunately can't talk about next. And Steve and I are also working on a project that we together cannot talk about next. So uh, I'd like to say that our dance card is pretty full right now. Uh, and I hate to be the tease, but unfortunately we can't talk about too much. For, for myself, I know that there's more nonfiction graphic novel storytelling in my in my future. And uh, that's something that I'm really fascinated by and excited to, to keep tackling. And I know Steven's uh, doing a lot of writing as well. Uh, yes, uh, similar boat in that uh, there's a lot of things this past year that I've been working on that have yet to be announced um, that I'm very excited to talk about. Um, but um, yeah, started working with a new publisher called Epic, um, who's like an online distributor. Like they started up their own original comics line. And so I'm happy to start contributing to that. It's like all ages material. So definitely in my wheelhouse. So yeah, more from me in the future on that soon. Um, so, you know, I guess this has been, you know, this has been a weird year for comics in general, um, you know, and, and the world at large. How have you guys had to kind of pivot this year since, you know, normally we'd be doing this at, 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 at BarCon in Baltimore? Um, you know, how have you had to pivot um, in, in, in the year of the pandemic? Lots of Zoom calls, right? <laughs> Just every, every, everything's virtual. Um, getting yep. used to, actually, how about this, you know, as a, um, I'm sure anyone who's a who's an author or a creator, whether you're an artist or writer, we spend a lot of time on our own, isolated anyway. And now it's sort of like the world's getting a taste of our existence. Mm -hmm. I don't think they I don't think they like it very much, but uh, you know, it's been a lot of time to to focus, even though that can be draining as well, just because there's so much you know psychic nightmare out there. Steve, yeah. what about you? Uh, yeah, similar to what you said, it's, you know, I, I'm used to being, I guess, isolated and just, you know, as a writer, you know, so that doesn't bother me too much. Um, but I think this year really, it really hit me that um, the little amount of social interaction I get at BarCon at these conventions that, uh, that really, you know, takes its toll when you don't get that every once in a while, you don't get to, um, you know, my tank is empty in terms of like social en engagement this year. So it's been, um, it's been an adjustment, but it's been great for my kids because they get to see a lot more of me. So, well, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, that's that's that is awesome, um, fellas. Thank you guys so much for for taking the time to chat with us in uh, this Ringo Awards pre-show. Congratulations on all your well-deserved nominations uh, and and wins. Thank you. For likewise, the likewise. likewise. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, um, for those who um, haven't. Uh, I had the chance to read this amazing book yet. Um, where's the best place for them to order it? It's literally anywhere books are sold. It's uh, we're, we're very thankful for the reception and for the uptake. I mean, you can find it at your local library. If you get a library card, you can read it on Hoopla right now. You can order find it literally at every bookseller ha has it available right now. And so it's there's thankfully, I, I believe, no shortage of availability of George's graphic memoir, They Call This Enemy. And by the way, let me just say to everyone watching at home, on behalf of Stephen and I, I apologize that we're not George Decay and he's not here today entertaining you guys because I know David would be having probably a lot more fun and I'm no. sure the viewer, the viewer count would be going through the roof. So anyway, no. you know, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you get the you get us. Sorry about that, everybody. Hey, you know what? I'm I'm excited to be chatting with you guys. Um, thank you guys so much for 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 taking the time. Um, so yeah, um, so it looks like I will actually be hosting this next hour as well. Um, and it sounds like, um, do we have David Kelly, um, in, in the waiting room? I'm right here. Awesome. Uh, David, Hello. thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Uh, we, we had a little bit of a, a, a of a last minute host switcheroo, um, <laughs> but I'm excited to, to, to chat with you. Um, uh, so yeah, you are nominated for best single issue. Um, and, um, right. Uh, best single issue. I'm still right. kind of, yeah, yeah. For tales of the night watchman, the steam banshee, um, for those who haven't read your book, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Well, uh, tales of the night watchman is about baristas who fight monsters. And for the past few years, uh, it's something that my, my partner, Laura and I have been self-publishing for a long time under the name. So it press, uh, but we've also been running a newspaper strip in the park slope reader, uh, which is available around Brooklyn. 
uh, in neighborhoods kind of uh, encircling Prospect Park. So we, we tell very New York oriented stories uh, about three baristas who work at Think Coffee, which is an actual cafe where Laura and I worked for a while. Uh, and that was where we met. Uh, we were inspired by that. Uh, we loved horror. So we wanted to bring everything that we love together, coffee and monsters and, and make some comics about all that. Uh, the Steam Banshee specifically is about a guy named Hector who lives in Park Slope and he's haunted by an entity uh, in his building that that rattles his uh, steam radiator. If, you know, if, if you live in a big city, but in particular New York, you have to deal with steam heat in the winter and it's very noisy. And uh, this is about something that's within those steam pipes and it may be connected to his past. Nice, nice. Um, that's super cool. I, I I feel like so you know this 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 has been an interesting just Ringo Awards in general because we're doing it all from home. But how does it feel? Just how how did, how did you feel when when you got the news that you'd been nominated? Oh, I was really excited. I mean, this is the first award that I've been nominated for in any capacity, so it's mm -hmm. great. Uh, and I love Baltimore Comic Con, and I've, I attended the Ringos before. I had a story in the Mine Anthology, so I got to be there with those guys, and they mm -hmm. won. But I was in the book, but it wasn't an award nomination for sure. me directly. So it was great hanging out with those guys. It was great being at the Ringos. Uh, I wish we were all there in person, for sure, doing it like we normally do. Um, but it, it is kind of weirdly ironic, too, where, yeah, you know, I've, I've always wanted to be nominated for Ringo, so this is kind of a check off on my list. But here I am at home. You know, so <laughs> I, I, I get to be nominated, but we're not partying like we used to, but it's still great. Right, right. Yeah, um, yeah I was going to say, you know, we get to do the whole the whole awards ceremony in our pajamas. Exactly. Um, I am yeah. wearing pants, though, I'll say that. I'm, I'm fully clothed in normal outside attire. So Look not, at you. I'm, I'm a little above pajamas. You're an overachiever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's why that's why we're nominees. Exactly. Um, so, right. yeah. So, um so yeah, I you know this has been this has been speaking of that we're doing all this here at home. This has been a wild year uh, as as far as you know just the state of the world, the state of the comics industry. Um, how have you had to pivot? Um, you know how how have you been holding up uh, during during all things pandemic? Well, basically fine. Uh, you know work stopped. I mean we haven't distributed comics. I'm actually in Chicago right now. All of our books are in New York, so I haven't been selling or doing anything. Uh, we started to work with Diamond at the end of last year, um, but we weren't able to really put out any new material. So it's been a year of working ahead and planning and hoping that we come back all as normal maybe sometime next year. So, you know, me and, and the guys that I work with, in particular, Brett Hobson, who's the current artist on Night Watchmen, you know, we've been chipping away at stuff, uh, but we don't have a concrete plan for distribution or releasing anything yet. We just thought, let's take this year to kind of lay things out, take our time, be productive, but not worry about, uh, you know, combating forces and, and, and systems that we just can't control right now. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that that alone is always just a little bit crazy to 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 deal with um you know I, I i guess for you you know you were talking about sort of you know figuring out just kind of the lay of the land mm -hmm. a little bit yeah. um and i'm curious i mean where do you see the industry in general where do you see that headed uh you know sort of in, in the next year the next couple years post pandemic i mean where where do you think the the industry is going to go especially post some of the the weird contractions that our industry has seen just over the last seven months. Yeah, that's I I suck at predicting the future, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so I, I think that uh, in a lot of ways, as far as readership goes, I think things will be okay. I think that uh, comic shops that were able to stay open will persevere. I'm sure we've lost some. I'm sure we'll lose more. Uh, things won't be perfect, and there will be a slow recovery. I've actually been working part time at a comic shop in Chicago, Comics Revolution. So uh, I've I've seen that uh, you know we're doing okay there. And mm -hmm. people have been coming in, and I think people have been excited to read in this time, and they do crave that social interaction. So I think people will still want that, and then they will want to get it as soon as they can. Uh, and I think we all desire for things to be back to normal. Uh, I guess if I were to be a little bit pessimistic, I'm not quite sure we'll be doing shows next year. Sure. That's kind of my prediction. We might be staying around and finding other ways to interact, maybe like this. Um, so I think that interaction is going to be different. I'm not sure if at least next year we'll be back to normal partying like we used to. Um, but, you know, I guess it could be a lot worse. I think the industry will be okay. So, you know, it, it, you're, you are unique, uh, especially in the best single issue or story category, because you were, you were kind of, 
you're you're going it alone. I mean, um, you're so wet. Press is is a, a very indie outfit. Um, you know, I mean, it, 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 this is this is you, correct? That's your that's yeah, your self publishing. It's me and, and Laura Antal. You know, we're we're, we're co owners, uh, and and really the primary thing we've done for the past eight years or so is Tales of the Night Watchmen. We've uh, published other mini comics and, a, and an mm -hmm. anthology along the way. Um, but yeah, we we do kind of do it in conjunction with other things. Laura's a freelance illustrator. I do a lot of freelance editing. I, I do some stuff for First Second. Mm -hmm. I've written some uh, educational middle grade books for uh, libraries and schools and stuff like that. So you kind of juggle a lot. So um, I, I kind of like that control. Um, it is nice to just have one thing that is your own. You get to do it any way you want. And you get to kind of, you know, um, go up that mountain by yourself for better or for worse. I, I like those challenges. So that's, that's what we've done it the way we've done it. I feel like you were kind of ahead of the curve in a lot of ways um, because, uh, you know, post or pre-pandemic, Everybody, I think it, it was sort of chasing sort of the, the, the publisher stamp of approval, so to speak. Yeah. Whereas now, I think post-COVID, it's uh, everybody's kind of realizing like, oh, like if we don't kind of go out on our own, sometimes just books don't get made. Mm -hmm. um, so how, first off, how do you feel being right? Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, sort of, sort of being ahead of the curve. But also, can you talk a little bit about some of the the the, the challenges that you've had to overcome? Just because you're you're doing it by yourself, you 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 know, without sort of without the infrastructure, but without also the red tape and the hoops that you'd have to jump through. You know, I hate being right in this situation because I, I love the idea of working with publishers and having that sort of growth and that expansion because, you know, publishers can uh, give you a lot of credibility and sure. open a lot of doors for you in other areas, even if the money's not always that great. Right. Uh, but I guess in, in, in this case... Um, yeah, I, we've seen a lot of shifts in that area where I think people have decided that, you know, you're, you're better off trying things your own. You're better off doing crowdfunding um, and, and man, maintaining that level of control because you don't have to wait for other people. Um, and you don't you don't get hosed up by the system, I guess. Um, so and, and that was one thing that I knew. I, I worked in film for a while and I kind of knew going into comics initially that it was going to you were going to experience those same challenges, even though the amount of money that you needed to raise was a lot less uh, and the volume of people you needed to work was far fewer. So those were all good things that I, I guess I foresaw and that's worked out well. But on the other hand, it's kind of like, well, um, opportunities kind of come along. I'm not I'm not I'm a big hustler when it comes to distribution and stores. And I think those are the, the biggest challenges still. And that's why a lot of people are, are trying to go out their own because they feel like once they get to a certain point, uh, those distribution channels and those exposure channels don't necessarily get better. And people are still just as frustrated. You're like, I've got a credit with this publisher. I look awesome and it's fantastic. And I feel great about that. But still, I, I still need to do the same amount of hustle that I was doing when I was self-publishing. And that's always been the biggest challenge for us too, is you know being an independent guy, uh, getting stores to take you seriously and also readers to take you seriously because you're not a household brand name. You know, you're not a big two sure. entity. Sure. Yeah. You know, and, and I guess because you've been talking about like, you know, that you've been doing Tales of the Night Watchmen for, for a, a, a while. Mm -hmm. First off, what do you think, what, what was different about the Steam Banshee? compared to your other stories uh, uh, under under that title? Well, it was weirdly a more personal story because I co-wrote it with my friend Katrina and we're both cancer survivors. Oh, wow. So I wanted to do a story about uh, sort of everlasting friendship in spite mm -hmm. of insurmountable odds. So sure. that, that's one thing that makes this one very special and more personal. Uh, and, and tomorrow I'm going to be on a panel at three o'clock with uh, Dean Haspiel and Stan Sakai and, and a few other people, uh, Alex Segura. And we're going to be talking about how um, you can inject autobiographical elements into genre comics. So sure. there is that deep level of even though we're working in fiction, we're having fun with monsters and all that kind of stuff. They could be very personal stories uh, in many different ways. And that's how the Steam Banshee is a little bit more personal. Got it. I mean, yeah, that, that's that's a great answer. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like... Um, uh, what's what's next for you i mean you know just, just the, the the it sounds like you know for for tales of the night watchman you've already i mean you've told years of stories under the tales of the night watchman do you have more stories that are more sort of night watchman stories coming out oh there's all other... oh yeah yeah for sure no i'm working on a a, a six issue mini series right now that's called the dream of death and wow. brett hobson and i and a lot of other people um there it's going to be primarily um 
a story that Brett Hobson's going to draw, but I've, you know, I've tapped into friends of mine who are going to do some backup stories for it. So we have like 24 pages of main story, two eight page stories in the back. It'll be a 40 page issue for six issues. Um, I've got a couple other small little things. One I can one I can talk about. I've I've got a story that'll be in the Thought Bubble anthology that was supposed to come out this fall, but that didn't happen. It will come out sometime next year, uh, and it's a tribute to my dad who passed away this year, sadly. So oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Yeah, thanks. Um, so you know, I, for for creators, I think, and we talked a little bit about this, but you know, there are, I think there are some creators who feel like the only way for them to actually succeed is oh, if they break down the doors at a publisher, and mm -hmm. you are clearly proof that that is not the case. For for aspiring creators who want to kind of get in on their own independent comics, I mean, was there any is there any advice you'd want to give them, or was there any sort of breakthroughs that you had in your creative process that kind of made you realize like oh, like I can do this, I can do this on my own, and I don't necessarily need anybody else to give me permission to do so. I think the best thing is finishing what you start, but if you have an idea that you believe in, just look back and get the book out there. Uh, you know, the first issue when I watched it. Part I did, we never done a comic before lives. It's a little rough around the edges, but we're so proud of it. Uh, and it opened up a lot of doors for us, even though it's not a perfect thing. We've certainly both progressed as readers ever since. So, so don't hide behind what you do, finish what you start, and be bold and get yourself out there and self publish. Uh, don't be afraid to walk into comic shops and see if you can consign things with them, you know, and, and do shows and just kind of make it, you know. A slow organic process. It's nothing's going to happen overnight for anybody. Uh, some people maybe it does, but not for me. But it's worked out nicely. It's it's been a very creatively fulfilling thing to do. Um, so yeah, um, you know, I I, I uh, what what is your uh, do, do do you have any plans? Uh, you know, as far as what's what's your Ringo Awards setup going to be tonight? Um, are you going to be uh, what what? Uh, it's, what Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was going to say, are you going to are you going to be are you going to be uh, uh, watching in your office? Are you going to be hanging out with family? Are you going to be uh, inviting friends to live stream? Or are you just yeah. uh, going to get the heaviest alcohol you possibly can? What's what's your what's your plans tonight for the award ceremony? My mom and I will be watching it together. That's that's Aww. the plan. I'm at home right now, so we'll be in the basement. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm probably going to grab some uh, faux champagne and pop that open and and just enjoy it and see how it goes. That's you know uh, not to uh, my first Ringo Awards uh, was was in 2017 and uh, my mother actually surprised me at the event. She crashed the event. Oh, um, that's great! So, yeah, uh, if you were there in person. I couldn't keep my mom away. She would I, show up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was she. I, I was just waiting at, at, at the pre cocktails and then somebody taps my shoulder and I was like, "Why are you not? Why are you not in Missouri?" So that's that's that's, that's a awesome. lovely story. Um. Uh. So yeah. Um. You know, uh, I guess let's see. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think if there's any. Is there anything else that you want to discuss that I haven't asked? Um, uh, as as far as these, uh, as far as the the, the Ringo Awards, uh, or just what you're working on in the future is concerned. No, I think that's it. I mean, so much stuff is hypothetical, very tentative right now, so I don't want to say too much. There's one other little thing. It's going to be a backup story in an image series, but I can't be too much more specific about that right now. But nice. I am looking forward to that. That's been a really nice kind of like light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so that's cool. But uh, yeah, but other than that, you know, um, I'm just excited that we get to do something. This is the only comics thing I've done all year, really. And it's, it's nice to, to be doing this at least. If anybody wants to uh, uh, order their copy of Tales of the Night Watchmen, the Steam Banshee, where's the best place for them to do it? Ah, well, so Steam Banshee is available for free online at parkslopereader.com. And if you want to look into buying the issues that we publish, I would go to anyonecomics.com. There's a store in Brooklyn that's going to handle distribution for us uh, while I am in Chicago and all the books are in New York. That would be the best way to get them. Great, 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 great. Um, Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us at our Ringo Awards pre-show coverage. Um, uh, uh, wishing you nothing but the best of luck uh, uh, tonight. Um, but uh, yeah, um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Hey, thanks a lot, David. It was great talking to you and congrats to you as well. Great. And uh, I, I believe uh, backstage we have uh, the, the the team for the Underfoot. Um Hi, um, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we had a little bit of a last minute host switch up. Uh, so I will be chatting with you uh, guys about uh, The Underfoot, um, which was uh, nominated for Best Kids Comic or Graphic Novel. Uh, congratulations. Um, thank you. How thank do you guys, you. How, do you, how do you feel about your nominations? 
Go for it, Emily. Shocked and excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like to, to go. Yeah, to go up with a uh, you know Dogman and Guts and New Kid was um, a shocker. <laughs> sure. I, I I can I can I can definitely uh, uh, understand that. What was the reaction when you guys uh, saw the Ringo Award nominations go up and you saw that your book was on that list? Uh, what What was the first reaction that went through your heads, Michelle? I read the list like six times <laughs> over and over again. I was like, "That can't be right. That can't be right." It was. Uh, I think we were all just immediately just a gaggle of energy. I uh, I woke up to a phone call from my boyfriend who said congratulations, and I said for what, you know? <laughs> and he said, oh, I get to tell you. And then he told me, and I was like, what? No, what? What? And then I had to look it up and be like, oh, that's crazy in a great way, you know. Well, con congratulations to to you both on this. For those who have not read The Underfoot, um, can you can you tell us a little bit about uh, about the book and what what it is? Well, um, Michelle can also chime in. One thing it's about is hamsters. So this is my <laughs> tiny hamster, and her name is Lily, and she is one of the inspirations for the book. Um, Hi, Lily. And, uh, <laughs> and these hamsters, she's just chilling here with me. These hamsters are uh, different. They have special abilities, they're intelligent, and they um, are living in a post-apocalyptic world in the Washington, D.C. area. All the humans, the giants that were, have disappeared. And these little hamsters are kind of struggling to survive with all the bigger animals and all the crazy stuff that's going on in their world. They encounter some challenges for which they need assistance um, and they meet some other animals in the first book that they didn't know existed. So that is kind of where everything takes off. And uh, really the book itself is about adventures and friendship and um, discovering new worlds and not thinking that you know everything about where you are once you start looking around. Michelle? Oh gosh. Um, I think it's also like a testament to friendship and even if you think you're a small helpless person you can still be a powerful change in the world. I think that's the biggest takeaway for me for the book. I, I love this high concept. That sounds so incredible. I, you know, and the thing that really stood out to me when you when you were describing it, uh, you know, the when you think of the, the post apocalyptic genre, you do not immediately think kids book. Um, and I, I, could you guys talk a little bit about how you were able to take what is usually a very kind of harsh genre and brought it into uh, you know a, a family friendly kind of setting. Uh, Michelle, why don't you uh, share how the art was influenced by that, and then I'll jump in. Sure. So um, I my background is with kids stuff. Like I worked on the Grumpy Cat comics, um, so it's like you know, like round, chubby animals, and so a lot of the a lot of the world building was, of course, by Emily and our and our co creator Ben uh, Fisher, um, and it was a lot of you know we have to make sure that the world feels big. Um, and so we can, we made it fun by, you know, adding in little, little Easter eggs in the background. You know, it's not all, you know, like grungy and sad. We actually tried to make all of the things from the human world that were adapted by the hamsters to be colorful. Like, you know, this is, this is remnant from the human world. You know, you can see magazines and lunch boxes that they've used for, you know, wallpaper and doors. Um, so that was one way that we kind of made it not super scary mm -hmm. and also you know fat chubby hamsters nothing yeah. scary about that <laughs> yeah um the i i it first it was just a, a hamster adventure story and then ben and i quickly started thinking you know where did the hamsters get their abilities well obviously they were a government experiment obviously you obviously know? and why were the why was the government experimenting on hamsters because they knew bad things were coming and so they started working on how to survive in different changing climates and cataclysmic events. And for instance, an airborne virus, uh, which is written into book one, we're really sorry, guys, um, <laughs> as, as one of the, the potential things that, that scientists were looking towards uh, in the science and history pages of the book. And so the, the hamsters were part of a, a government experiment to eventually build into something humans could use to survive. Unfortunately, since they tested on the animals first, the animals survived. And the humans, well, we don't know what happened to them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, 
I love every second of this interview. Uh, this is uh, this is this is everything you guys are saying is I I simultaneously love this and I'm deeply jealous that I did not come up with this. Um, so, was there a particular bit in the development of this story that was your favorite part or the part that just kind of made you laugh out loud or something that was kind of surprising for you and you're like, oh yeah, heck yeah, that works. I'm definitely gonna run with this. Um, I'll go with two things. One is uh, I, I am I am familiar with the government. I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I work for the government. And um, the, the joy of developing fake government agencies and things that they did and weird, you know, organizational charts of things that don't exist is one of the strange things that I like to do. I don't know why. I like weird little details. I like looking up strange science and figuring out how it can fit. So for me, one of the fun things is figuring out what real science or history influences what the hamster world is like. And then the other big joy was getting to see Michelle draw these little hamsters and tell us how she like discovered how to draw the little hamsters. And I'll let her talk about that, but I just love her art, the colors, everything to do with seeing what what's in our heads. Yeah, and, and for me, it was a lot of, you know, like I don't own a hamster. Emily has had a, a menagerie of hamsters. Um, so for me, it was like, you know, pre-pandemic, of course, I'd go into pet stores and I would just watch them or I'd watch YouTube videos. And I'm like, what are these things? They're not like dogs or cats, which I'm so used to drawing. Um, but they, I've described them as, it's kind of like, hamsters are kind of like, like stick figures stuck in a great big pillowcase, just <laughs> with like their arms and stuff because they're, they have so much um, like body yeah. and they're so chonky. And mm -hmm. so to to figure out how to draw them in their own unique way was really interesting because at, I think when I first started doing sketches, they looked a lot more like cat mice basically mm -hmm. until I really started to look into their body structures and you know their teeth and never, never, ever Google the inside of a hamster's mouth because it's horrifying. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And and hamster yawns. Don't Google that because no. that's when yeah. you see how big their mouths actually are. And it, yeah. is, it is kind of terrifying. Oh, I just did it. I just did it. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is a yeah. lot. That is a lot going on in there. So tiny, uh, but yeah. not so tiny. They're they're definitely bigger yeah, on the inside, they're, like they're a tortoise. Talking. Yeah, they they contain multitudes. Uh, yeah. you, you know, I think everybody has like a. a, a everybody has kind of a popular consciousness of like what a dog is like or what a cat is like uh hamsters is is i don't think i don't think people have that popular consciousness if you had to describe a hamster what is a hamster just for people who do, like everybody knows what an actual hamster is but just like the traits of a hamster how do you like how do you describe that go ahead michelle oh gosh um Besides Chonky, which of course I've used before, um, <laughs> they are really fast considering how small and okay. chonky they are. Um, their ears are much smaller. I think when people think of rodents, they think of like yeah. great big Mickey Mouse ears. Hamster right. ears are actually really tiny, which was a hard learning curve for me. When I, if, if you look at the original drawings, they're like huge, huge mouse ears. And then I would look at it side by side with an actual hamster. It's like, no, they're not like that. They're they're just a lot more rotund as <laughs> as a rodent. Um, yeah. but, and and Emily can talk about this. There are actually so many different kinds of hamsters, and we incorporate a ton of different breeds of hamsters into the book. Yeah, so I, I've had rodent pets all my life. I've had gerbils, mice, chinchillas, and two different breeds of hamster. So um they all have their own strange traits, but hamsters especially. They do, Michelle, without knowing it, was correct on hamster anatomy itself because most of their arms and legs are inside their skin with the muscles. So when she says it looks like these little poofy onesies or these little pillowcases, it's because hamster movement is happening under their skin for the most part. So they're built very differently. And then different kinds have the different traits. So one of my hamsters, uh, actually the ones that I've had that look like this that are Chinese dwarf hamsters, they are very good climbers and can just climb right up me and sit on my shoulder because they have these little claws that grip. And my other hamster, Ellie Puff, um, who's no longer with us, sadly, she was a hamster that had very powerful back legs and could jump 
off of my lap, which was disturbing the first time I discovered that that was a thing that hamsters could do because I didn't know. And she just whoop, right onto the floor. And I was like, are you okay? You know, but um, they're also very resilient. I called her my little rubber ball. Mm. She did that at least three or four times, even though I was did my best to keep a watch on her. Um, so don't carry them up here is what I'm saying, because they'll just right off. But, uh, you know, they have they have these big cheek pouches, but, you know, like the food just gets stuffed back in there and then they they can snack on it. Um, and they're they're strange little creatures. They sleep a lot during the day, but sometimes wake up and then they they're awake at kind of twilight and dusk. And they're very fast and they're very fun to watch. They're cute. <laughs> I feel like there's been a long history of anthropomorphic characters in comics. I mean, you can look back at, at the Ninja Turtles. You can look at Mouse Guard. You can look at uh, the Underfoot. What do you think is the popular appeal of, of, of that trope through comics history or maybe through entertainment history? What, 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 what's the appeal of, do you think, uh, of, of the anthropomorphic animals? Uh, well, to me, there's two things. One is they're, they're really cute or they're fun to watch or it's exciting to see something that's not a human having human characteristics. And I mean, that I, I love Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I am a huge fan of Watership Down, Chronicles of Narnia, you know, all of those things that, that have influenced the book in their own ways, uh, Rats of Nim. And so it's cool to think about these creatures and how they would encounter a human world because that's that's different to them. And so it's like a fish out of water in a little bit or how they adapt. The other thing I think is really important and you see this with more serious books like Mouse, but it also hopefully comes into our book. You can bring your thoughts about how humans should treat each other or might wanna consider behaving into things without people feeling personally attacked the same way they might if it's a human who looks just like them or has the same job. So I think that's a valuable way to write about what a world could be like without people feeling like uncomfortable about it instead of just starting to think. Sure. Um, so uh, this has been a crazy year, just in, in general. And you were saying that like, oh, we have an airborne virus in our book. Uh, you know, it, it's been a crazy year um, just for the world, for the comics industry as a whole. How have you two had to pivot this year in terms of uh, the way you do business? Uh, Michelle, go ahead. Sure. Uh, it's been wild. The last time I traveled was for C2E2 and literally like got back, was getting ready for Emerald City, and then everything was shut down. Um, so I actually work for Oni Press, um, the mm -hmm. publisher. And so my world was completely blown up, you know, no more traveling, no more working with coworkers. And it's just been it's been hard. I mean, Emily's in DC, Ben and I are in Portland, Oregon. And so we do a lot of communication via text and email anyway. So not, none of that really changed. Um, but it, I mean, everything was disrupted. Yeah, we might be more used to video chatting now <laughs> than we were before, actually, but um, which would, will be valuable for us. Um, for me, my job continued because uh, we went to full-time telework and have been ever since. So I'm still working full-time, which is fortunate. I feel very fortunate. And you know, I know a lot of people haven't had that, but uh, right after C2E2, I got sick for three weeks, question mark coronavirus, we don't know, but I was, I was sick. And so I was already self-quarantining when my whole office went on self-quarantine or, or whatever, uh, telework. And so I, you know, I had that. I'm actually, I am I usually in Virginia where the book is set, but right now I'm in Ohio uh, living with my boyfriend. And then, you know, that was a thing that we weren't able to do before. So now that's an exciting new thing. Um, and, uh, and there's just been a lot of upheaval generally. Um, obviously the, the book is still had to, the second book, uh, The Underfoot Into the Sun, our second book that's coming out in April next year, had to continue being worked on and get done. And we had to continue doing everything while we're reading the crazy news and all of that. So yeah, there's been a lot of upheaval. I'm fortunate my jobs kept going, but of course, mental health is something that we should all remember. We all are going through a difficult time. So I've had anxieties. I've had struggles with all of that it to do with are, is my job going to call me back to work? What is going to happen? You know, like work in the office, like what's happening? It, is the world going to, you know, be all so much worse than we could even imagine in our underfoot books? You know, I don't know. So there's a lot to struggle with. People are having a hard time. And so, of course, amongst my friends and colleagues, you know, we, we're all sharing these stories. 
Great, 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 great. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Uh, best of luck for the Underfoot. It sounds amazing. Real quick, uh, where can people order it if people want to get a copy? Um, they can order it from uh, potentially bookstores like uh, Barnes and Noble, and and you can go to Target. You can find it on Amazon. You can support your local bookstores if you can ask them to order it for you. That's always great. You know your indie or local or comic bookstores, and um, you know it's it's up on all the major sites as well. <laughs> great, 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 great. Thank you both so much for taking the time. We have Craig Yo uh, it, it backstage, um, so uh, if we can bring Craig. Uh, hey. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to chat. We uh, we had a little bit of a host switch up at the last second, so I'm glad to be chatting with you. Uh, uh, me too. Congratulations on your nomination. Best presentation oh, so much. for Marvel Masterwork pinups. Who, um, who do I, own, I, I Who do I give the kickback to? And what's the going rate? Like 20, <laughs> 20 well, 20 bucks? Uh, is that good? Yeah, uh, I'll take it. I take pen, uh, PayPal, or Venmo. Um, so, uh, yeah. No, uh, first off, I mean, uh, you're 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 an industry veteran. Um, how did you feel uh, when when you got the word about well, veteran? Uh, that means old, doesn't it? That's, that's, a, that's a euphemism for <laughs> just, old. Yeah. It's okay. Just yeah. More experience than me. Um, uh, you, that that you just you just have more of a track record than I do. How did you feel when when you you heard about these uh the 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 Ringo noms this year? I was excited. John, Paul, George, Ringo. I love those guys. <laughs> um, so so talk a little bit about, because I feel like people talk about best presentation and design. And I feel like out of all the categories in the Ringos, that's often considered the most nebulous. Um, and, and so for, you know. All these euphemisms from you today, like ne most nebulous, that means most least important, right? I was going to just say hardest to understand. Oh, okay. um, and so for, for those who don't get this category, um, and I say the same thing, I'm, I'm also in this category for going to the chapel and I am like, still like, I don't quite get it. Um, you know, so that's interesting. When, when I was, when I was uh, much younger and not a veteran, yeah, <laughs> I, I worked uh, for uh, Marvin Glass, which was the first and largest toy think tank. And I got, I got the job mm -hmm. and uh, because, Kind of based on my creativity and 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 bullshitting in the interview, but uh, so I became the senior designer. And but the first day I arrived at work, all of a sudden I realized, like, wow, people design toys. Like I never, re I just thought toys kind of magically appeared, and I never thought about that people design things. And then I, yeah. you know, I met other people there at, at at the toy think tank who were who had studied to become designers, industrial designers. And, and through them, I realized like, ah, you know, people design salt shakers and door handles and, and briefcases and everything's designed and, and uh, books are designed. So like, you know, you put together a book of comics, you're not only thinking about the comics, Mm -hmm. But you're thinking about, you know, the presentation and they use the word presentation in the in, in the uh, title of the award design right. presentation. So I guess I I present uh, I design books and make and, and through them present comics. And so that's what uh, me and the other uh, fine people that are that are up for the nomination are being recognized for our our efforts at, at making a nice presentation, which might be very obvious because some some designs are kind of fancy schmancy and sure. in your face and others are kind of subtle and, and, and you don't realize like, wow, that salt shaker was designed for to, for to be nicely functional and look nice on the table. And th that book is, the comics are the main thing, but around it, there's a, you know, a logo and you decide what paper to use and how much of a margin to leave around the comics and what the page numbers on the comics will look like and all these like designy shminy things. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, it, this is, this is, th this is actually very eye opening for me. Cause I feel like I, I always tried to think about stuff like that, especially for, for my work. And I always just thought I was overthinking it, but now you're telling me, no, that there, there, there's actual, there are people that that's exactly what they think about. Um, so that actually is very validating for me. Um, what is you know, it that you do? 
Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm a writer, but um, oh, okay. you know, working sort of on, on the, the super indie side of the equation, I wind up being sort of the editor and the project manager, and I'm kind of right. sort of overseeing right, 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 every right, right. element of it. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, I have been in the comics field for a long time, and, mm -hmm. and you know, there's more and more thinking about design now, and the, the, the these books can look nice, but when comics were when I got into comics, they were just all kind of the same, you know, they were the floppy, uh, small size kind of comic books and stuff. And uh, no one thought about design much. And and and, and I, now I realize that some of the companies that I like, like Dell, uh, these are old companies that they're no longer business. So I'm losing, we're losing the young people who are, who are switching off. But, uh, you know, there was companies like Dell and Charlton and people like that, that, that actually put design chops into the comics. And, and, you know, now they credit everybody for like letters and colorists and everything, which is a good thing. But back then there was, there was little credits, maybe an artist and a writer might get credit, but designers didn't get any credit. So I don't, I'll never be able to, yeah, even as a historian, I, as a researcher, all that knowledge of is lost of who designed, you know, some of those comic book covers, who did the logos and, who you know? Who who made the interesting layouts and stuff? I mean, most of the pages were just the same page after page of reprinting comics, but there sure. were some really nice design elements and color choices and and uh, you know ways of putting together the product that you know that, that made them look like it made them look nice and accessible and attractive to kids mostly. Yeah. I was I was going to say you know because you are working with you know the, the these these pinups from yesteryear I mean um, you know mm. Ditko Kirby uh, you know and I'm I'm curious is your process for this is it I, I assume it's it's you're sort of taking it, it, it's it's is it to preserve kind of the historical elements that they had with their design back then or sort of what do you see your role as being when you're interacting with these sorts of the, the, these titans of yesteryear um, when you're well, sort of, yeah. I was kind of touching on that in, the, in that some, some design draws more attention, book design draws more attention to the designer's work than the, than the comic book artists mm -hmm. who are inside their, their work. And so you try to, I mean, I, I try to put a little, a little, some nice design chops into a book, but I try to, ultimately showcase the work of Ditko and Kirby and and friends, you know, to show off them and make them the center stage. So in some ways you don't notice the design right? Uh, as much. As I, I, I try not to overly design a project like that so that the, you know, the uh, the king of comics, Steve, who is Steve Ditko, I'm sure you agree, mm -hmm. and, and people like also Jack Kirby, who's royalty also, yeah. Uh, so, so that their work stands out, you know. So, uh, and I, and I, I am influenced by growing up and reading comics as a kid, as as far as my color choices and mm -hmm. and 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 I think being so crazy about comic books when I was young made made me realize that book design is like comics. It's the integration of words and pictures. So you have the pic. The pictures, which are co the comics, mm -hmm. primarily, that's, I'm referring to them as the pictures. But then you have the, like the introduction and the title page, which is like the first page with the name of the book on it. And the end papers, which are the, you know, when you open up the cover of a hardback book, there's a two-page spread that sometimes it's just a color or, or even just white paper. But I like to maybe do something a little fancy. I This time I just took one of the horizontal type pinups they had in an old Marvel comic and I kind of blew it up. So what, I, I, I don't know why anyone would give me an award for that, but, uh, <laughs> but that $20 went a long way, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, uh, but sometimes I do something fancy like a repeat pattern or something or ghost back an image for the end paper. So, you, you know, the second you open the book, it gives you a feeling for the book and gives, makes you kind of want to keep turning the pages and, and is reader friendly, you know, so that, you know, just like uh, you don't want to de design a salt shaker that I keep referring to. It's so fancy that the salt doesn't pour out good, you know, right. so you, you want it to be functional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yet you want it to be aesthetically, you want the salt shaker also 
function first, but then aesthetically pleasing, you know, so it looks nice on your right dining room table as, as you salt your French fries. Did you have any moments uh, working on this book that were particularly surprising for you? Or were there any moments that you felt particularly excited uh, uh, about any of the choices that you made on the design front? Oh, two good questions. I, I, I think initially what surprised me is how many great pinups there were. I, you know, when I, I actually, a friend of mine suggested the book and I, I asked him and he didn't know for sure. And, and I was asking myself and the other friends, are there enough pinups to make up a, a great book? You know, cause you want mm -hmm. all killer, no filler when you, right. when you do a book. And so I, 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 you know, I grew, I was a kid, I got all the Marvel comic books and I had them all. And, but, uh, you know, I sold that collection a long years ago and so i didn't have my own comics to refer to but i i couldn't quite remember i mean i i knew there were some that stood out in my mind and in some places like the first fantastic four annual that there were some great pinups in it but i didn't know if there was enough you, you want at least 100 pages in a in a book sort of for it to feel worthwhile and substantial and like people are getting a good perceived value you know right. enough money uh, you know, you know, return on their investment, so to speak. So you want, want to make sure you have enough pages. So, but then I, I turned out, I was so surprised how many fantastic, like Fantastic Four, amazing, like Amazing Spider-Man and incredible, like, like the Hulk. Hulk. There were all these fantastic, amazing, incredible uh, pinups, you know? So mm -hmm. that was, that was the first discovery. And I was in, re I was relieved, you know? So mm -hmm. Your second question was real good, but I can't. What was it again? Something well, about I, I had asked. Um, well, I asked if there was anything surprising, but I uh, uh, asked if there were any any particular creative choices that you made that you felt particularly well, excited. Thing, about. Like, I, I got uh, the book here. Is one thing I I uh, I I, I use this particular pinup uh, by by the King of Comics, Steve Ditko, for the cover, and and that that was a kind of a hard choice, you know, because. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you only have one image on the cover. I mean, unless it's some kind of collage thing, which doesn't really work these days. When when most times people see a, a, a book covers, you know, it's about this this size on an internet site. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's not like, sadly, it's not like mo most of the books are sold through through stores. So you gotta you gotta have a very sim in in some ways this cover has to be simple so it can be. A, a matchbook size you know on on on, uh, on an internet retail site so right. you have one shot yeah you, you can only choose one cover so i thought like do i use the ever loving thing which was probably my f that it was by kirby and we're we're in uh you know where the thing is saying clobbering time in a in a pinup and uh do i use that on the cover but you know in some ways, I mean, not in some ways. I don't think the thing is uh, is popular Spider Man. So I thought, like, well, Spider Man for me represents Marvel and to, and to the public too. So I wanted to choose a, a nice image, but uh, so I chose I, I chose this pinup that that Steve uh, Ditko had done, and it's it's kind of an unusual one, and it's kind of an unusual figure, and it's kind of a weird pose. And actually, to be honest, uh, my, my good friends, and I, I mean that sincerely, and Marvel, they kind of pushed back because they, did, they didn't think that was like maybe the best pinup in huh. their minds, you know, or, or the best pinup of Spider-Man or the best pinup by Steve Ditko. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just let them, I, I didn't I didn't push hard because it's a, it's a collaborative effort, it's a team sure. effort, but I guess they thought about it a little more and they go, yeah okay I, I, maybe i said a few words in its defense and they said yeah okay we, we kind of see that this, this this could work so they let me they, they have final approval of spider-man sure. said their their guy and uh but you know so they gave the final nod and and we used that particular pose and i like it because it is different it is an unusual pose and it's not uh, as is seen as is as much as some of the other spider-man poses i probably Inside, I probably use the other Spider-Man poses, like uh, you know, this is probably sure more more uh, famous or uh, right recognizable. And then, but I was able to use this, and instead of and instead of having it on the cover, I had that other one. But then across from this, it worked out nice because in a lot of the uh, 
pages in, in spreads, we call it two pages, we call it a spread. Us designers, that's designer lingo. Uh, you know, we put the original artwork uh, beautifully reproduced across from that, so you can kind of study, you know, sure. what that looked like. And then uh, after, before the colorist uh, and the printer did their work. So, uh, so that, that that was one of the choices I made. I, you know, and, and then, but then I ended up putting uh, at the very last second, Heritage Auction, who have been good friends of ours, uh, got uh, the thing pin up I was just talking about uh, to, to, to auction off. So I, mm -hmm. I can't even remember what I had on the back cover, but it, I think I think we were even going to press and then we were looking at the final proofs and Heritage put this incredible uh, pinup of, of Benjamin, uh, the ever blue eyed, ever loving thing, uh, up for auction. So I said, Hey, can you give me a scan of that? And, That's awesome. And, uh, so we put the, that, which is my favorite pinup, uh, from the, from the, those days, uh, did, did get on the back. It made the back cover. <laughs> so it's, uh, uh, so that was fun. Uh, so you never know, you know, at the last second that came along and it wasn't what I was planning on, but it, it, it worked out good. And so I was pleased about that. Well, what else do you want to know? What else can I tell you? Well, we, we actually, we have to wrap up actually. We'll wrap up! Craig, thank you so much for taking the time My to chat with us. My great pleasure. I hope everybody gets the book and uh, they, it's on all the, it is on all those internet sites, but it, yeah, I agree with the last presenter. Support your comic shop above all and or, or your local independent bookstore, but uh, get the book and enjoy. Thank you so much, Craig, for taking the time. Best thank of you. luck tonight. Um, so we have David Avalone uh, uh, backstage and I am actually taking off my host hat, passing it to David. Um, so, uh, yeah, Avalone, um, are you ready? Uh, uh, let's, let's, let's I, chat. I am, I am ready. I have my coffee in my, in my Shannon Wheeler. That makes, that makes one of us. <laughs> coffee man mug. Yeah. Well, I, there are survival issues if I, if I can't get the coffee in me, uh, the liquor will be added probably in time for the writer's block. It's a little early for that out here on the West coast, but Welcome, David Pepos. 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 You got it right the first time. Pepos. God damn it. Uh, welcome, David Pepos, as guest. Uh, Multi Ringo Award nominated this year. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I didn't know. I was watching your last one. I had not noticed that you were up for design for, uh, for going to the chapel. For going to chapel. Now, how? Uh, I actually promised some people that when I started the interview, I would tell you that I do love Calvin and Hobbes, but I, <laughs> but I don't like Quentin Tarantino. So that they modify your pitch accordingly. But uh, uh, for those who don't know, that's a common David Pepos yep. opening question to a <laughs> pitch. But I do love going to the chapel. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a terrific series. Thank you. Uh, how much input did you have into the design of the book? Uh, uh all of it um yeah, yeah. I, I you know it, it the the thing is is so um so my the books that i was nominated for were uh, the sequel to my book spencer and Locke, and then going to the chapel and working at a publisher with a publisher like action lab um i have a lot of latitude um one might say i have all the latitude um sure. i am for all intents and purposes the editor of my own books um you know my uh, uh action lab will make sure that the book is ready for print and they'll right. sort of give it a once over to make sure that there's no typos. Um, but um, other than that, all the choices kind of go through me. Sure. And so I was really fortunate, especially with a book like that. I, 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 I thought we could do a lot of fun visual stuff that we wouldn't necessarily be able to do with a normal direct market book. Right. Um, I, I've said, you know, Gavin Guidry, our, our series artist, Liz Kramer, especially our colorist. I feel like Liz really kind of set the tone for the whole book. It's a beautifully colored book. Um, they, it's been kind of described as almost like a femme Western, uh, which I think <laughs> is, 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 a, is a cool way to describe it. Um, but also just the fact that we were able to have like a real murderer's row of cover talent. Uh, involved um and so uh you know people like uh, mon house in particular um he's my ride or die we've worked on every series together and um i think for me the cover that really was most exciting um i had said we should do an andy warhol homage sure. for our second issue and so mon and i worked on that together uh, it was a very collaborative process because i oversaw a lot of the colors mm-hmm 
and um, the idea of uh, going to the chapel for, I probably should give the high concept real quick. It's about um, a uh, uh, the wedding from hell, and that was before the bank robbers showed up. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's 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 uh, it's a hostage comedy set at a wedding. Um, the, uh, the, the bank robbers are known as the bad Elvis gang. Um, so they're all wearing Elvis masks. So having a cover with nine Elvises and one sure. bride or you eight Elvises, you, you can't, can't go, go wrong. wrong. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, it, it, I was blown away to be nominated for that. Um, uh, because I feel like, yeah, this book, it looks unlike anything else in the direct market. And I think that was, uh, that was kind of the strength of the book. I think uh, that was also certainly the fear of a lot of publishers who said we wouldn't know how to sell a book like this. Sure. Um, but yeah, so getting that nomination, uh, it felt very vindicating, and I, I owe that to the amazing talent that we uh, that we were really able to amass for this book. Well, I think that you know that's a one of the first uh, painful lessons we learn in a life in show business or the arts is the fun part the making the art part, if you're lucky, that's 50% of the effort that you need to put in. The other 50% is making sure anyone in the world sees the goddamn thing. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, cover design is a part of that. My first job as a writer, the contract included write back cover copy, write front cover copy, and describe 20 illustrations that we might have done for it. And I <laughs> did it, and the editor was like, huh, this is our 150th book and no one has ever read the contract. No author has ever given us back copy, <laughs> cover copy. And I'm like, you can leave that in other people's hands. And if you have any kind of pride in your work, no matter how yep. good they are, yep. they're not going to care as much as you do. No one will love your baby the way that you yeah. love your baby. No one. I, so, so I, yeah, and, you know, it's great that, you know, it's the, you kind of wish it's like, boy, it'd be nice to, hand in the thing and then everybody magically does the job perfectly and I don't have to touch it and everybody makes me rich and famous, but that is not the, it never works that way. And, uh, and so you have to take it in hand. And I know you, you know, in your career, you're the kind of guy who like, yes, I, 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 I get my hands dirty. Yeah. You get uh, your, your hands dirty, and you're also up for best single Andrew issue Rock, individual issue. Yeah. Um, Season two, number one. Yep. Uh, uh, very popular first run. And yeah. there's a pressure to start again and hit the same level. And clearly you succeeded. Thank you. Well, yeah. For, for those who, who aren't familiar with Spencer and Locke, the high concept is what if Calvin and Hobbes grew up in Sin City? So it's about hard-boiled Detective Locke, who is solving a brutal murder with the help of his imaginary seven-foot-tall Blue Panther named Spencer. And so um, our first volume uh, was uh, basically a, a love letter, an homage, a parody of Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes. Sure. Uh, we wore influences proudly on our sleeves from the very first page. Uh, uh, Ringo Award nominated artist Jorge Santiago Jr. and I. Um, our second, our sequel, we decided to take it across the funny pages. So we did uh, Hard Boiled Calvin and Hobbes versus Homicidal Beetle Bailey is kind of the right. uh, high concept. And um, I, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't feel... I surprisingly didn't feel a ton of pressure. I, I had had the idea of the character of Roach Riley in my head for years, uh, even before I pitched Jorge on the book. Um, and so I, um, yeah, it, it, so it was funny. That first issue kind of poured out of me um, really, really quickly. And usually it I, I have a lot of agonizing and soul searching, but uh, recasting Beetle Bailey as sort of this Travis Bickle type sure. um, felt very natural to me. And, um, you know, I think Beetle, I Beetle seen some shit, man. Yeah. Yeah. Beetle's and been through a lot. he's been through a lot. <laughs> he's and, been through a lot. <laughs> and, um, he was such a fun character to write. You know, I, I said, sure. I said it was uh, Heath Ledger's Joker meets the taxi driver. And, sure. um, and so that was when you, when you have a sequel like that, when you have a villain, that's so fun to sink your teeth into the rest comes kind of naturally. Um, and so, yeah, I felt really proud of that issue. We were able to kind of throw in some like homages to Alan Moore. Um, we right. did, um, uh, we introduced Spencer and Locke through like a Rorschach test and kind of quickly recapped the first series that way. Um, and, uh, exposition is always very difficult for me. So I felt like that was a fun, easy, low impact way to do it. I kind of let, uh, uh, Jorge and colors, Jason Smith, uh, let their art do the talking. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I was so 
thrilled to see people uh, come back for that second series. I mean, our first series felt like the little indie that could. Um, you know, we were we were well represented in the Ringo Awards the year that came out, and um, the fact that people decided to roll the dice on us twice uh, really meant a lot. So um, now the pressure's on for Volume Three, and I'm still I was gonna at work. Say, I was going to ask about Volume Three. We're and doing. That's coming along. Yeah, we're doing a, a, a Garfield themed serial killer who's picking <laughs> off the Peanuts gang. Um, on Mondays, does he only uh, kill on Mondays? Kills, the killer kills on Mondays. Uh -huh. um, so I'm um, I'm very excited with how that's going. Um, you know, we're we're I'm still chiseling away at the scripts. Sure. Uh, I've I've said the difference between part one and part two is, uh, you know, I didn't have any scripts between the first two series. I've had six books that I've had to write in between parts two and three. So mm -hmm. um, I'm very excited about that. Um, and yeah, the fact that people really seem to respond to the sequel. Um, it means a lot, and it, it it and I'm very excited to see how we kind of wrap up the series with Volume Three. Oh, is that the the intention is to just is to finish it there? You couldn't be, you couldn't <laughs> be tempted by uh, the family circus. Mom, yeah, meet, uh, meet Funky Winker Bean. Uh, uh, we we you know we do murder Les Moore. Uh, in in volume two, uh, he gets murdered with a helicopter. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, you know, it's one of those things. It's a book. It's a tricky book. You know, it, you want to kind of sure. strike the right tone and walk that tightrope, and you never want to overstay your welcome. So, um, I, I feel like three was always kind of the the end goal. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, this book especially, you know, we're we're climbing Everest not once, not twice, but three times with uh, Peanuts and Garfield and Calvin and Hobbes. So right. beyond that, it's sort of everything else feels a little downhill. But you know, never say never. Um, you know, if the response to Volume Three is so overwhelming, um, sure. you know, I have a family circus arc in my back pocket. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 the the uh, the the the. La Familia, in this case, um, uh, sure, uh, La sure. Familia Carnival. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, we, we've got other. I've got other fun stuff on the horizon. Uh, my my Kickstarter, the OZ, just wrapped. Right. Still... Let's talk about the OZ a little bit. Uh, yeah, that looks amazing. I contributed. It's one Thank of the you. Mad many... Max beats the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a great idea. And the thing is, people have. It's very impressive to come up with a new version of that because, like, the Sci Fi Channel had like a sort of half-assed Dorothy and I think it was Zoe Deschanel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was called The Tin Man or something like that. Oh, yeah, it, yeah. it was, it was underwhelming. It didn't mm -hmm. quite, it didn't, it's very hard to nail that. And I right. think it looks, you know, obviously I haven't read it yet, but the previews look great. It's going to be and fun. It, I promise. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great direction to go. Thank you. I, I think that with that material. I always try to find, you know, you, you take a concept at face value and then you try to poke the holes in it and figure out. Mm -hmm. So for The Wizard of Oz, I thought, you know, Dorothy kills two wicked witches and gets the wizard to leave in like a week and then leaves. Yeah. And well, I was she like, completely upends the civilization of it, it, Oz. It felt like Baghdad to me. It felt yeah. like the war in Iraq. And so uh, recasting. The, the Wizard of Oz through that lens um, felt very natural to me and yet felt like a very different spin that kind of taps into these themes of trauma that I like to explore and action, but still in a way that feels very organic. And we were, yeah. we were, we were able to do it with my new book coming out in January, Scout's Honor, which you can mm -hmm. order from your local comic shop starting next week, um, where it's, yeah, it's a, it's a post-apocalyptic cult. Um, after the bombs drop, uh, right. they rise from the ashes and their Bible is an old Boy Scout manual. Right and sort of and the who's idea. The, who's the publisher on that? Aftershock. Um, okay. And so, uh, you know, working with artist uh, Luca Casalinguida, um, mm -hmm. it's uh, super fun. Um, just the idea of you look at the Boy Scout manual and you look at the bylaws and um, you 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 realize there's something a little religious about it. And when you sort of frame it like this, like this way, there's so many fun and interesting stories that you can wring out of this. So um, yeah, it's very exciting. And um, I couldn't be more grateful to everyone who's ordered our books, who's ordered the OZ, who's, um, who's bought, uh, you know, who, who's going to order Scout's Honor. Um, so yeah, you know, just stick around. Um, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at my handle right there in the, in the corner. Um, but yeah, um, thank you so much for for, for oh, taking the time to chat with me about all my this. My absolute pleasure. Uh, 
but uh yeah um so yeah um uh anybody who wants to follow me follow me on facebook twitter and instagram uh pepos d or david pepos comics um you can follow my newsletter pep talks at bit.ly slash pep news and uh yeah you can still order the first issue of the oz on backer kit so uh the oz comic dot backer and uh yeah thank you so much uh, my pleasure and you will be up at two o'clock Yes, three hours from now. Western, five o'clock Eastern on the writer's block with me, Rylan Grant, and Stance Akai. That, Stance that Akai. Small independent artist. Come um, on, he, Stance Akai uh, and Troy Little, my collaborator on Rag, Rag Dolls and a million other amazing comics, and Scott Dunbeer from uh, IDW. Should be an amazing show. Thank you guys so much for having me. And uh, yeah, keep watching your Ringo's pre-coverage. Um, and yeah, I will see you in just a few hours. Okay. I'm waiting to see who they serve me up next to talk to. And it is Dirk Manning and... Hi. Oh, hey. Hello. How you doing? Antonia Krupa, also yeah. known as Juniper, and Dirk Manning. Hey kids. Hello. So, uh, did I Krupa? Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Excellent. I wanted to, as someone who frequently has to uh, correct the pronunciation of his last name, uh, for which I blame Sylvester Stallone, who pronounces his name wrong. Uh, <laughs> I always, I always like to get uh, people's names right. So let's start with uh, Dirk Manning. Welcome. Thank uh, you. you're up for Haunted High Ons. Tell us, tell us about your comic. What's it, what's it about? Yeah, um, Haunted High Ons. This is a, uh, graphic novel from Source Point Press. It is, uh, featuring the rap rock hybrid. There it is right there. The, uh, <laughs> rack, rap rock hybrid band Twisted. And in the comic, they are, uh, fake ghost hunters who get called to a real haunted house. And, uh, hilarity and hijinks ensue. So they are they are a a band who also are Ghostbusters, more or less. Yeah, they uh, in the comic they kind of do the uh, they're a band in real life. You know. Obviously. Oh, okay. Yeah, and okay. Um, in the comic they kind of supplant their music career or support their music career with this uh, kind of fake ghost busting racket, and sure. quickly find out that not only. Uh, are ghosts real, but they actually have the uh, the ability to kind of interact with them and get involved in a very large, I don't want to say conspiracy, but a very large series of events that kind of sure. takes their life in a different direction. That sounds fun. Now, is this an ongoing? Was this a mini series? I'm sorry, I don't have the research in front of me. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, it started as a one shot with Source Point Press. The one shot did very well. We then did the full mini series of uh, Darkness Rises, which got nominated for Best Humor Comic. And then Mariana got nominated for Best Illustrator, Alessandro for Best Colorist. Nice. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. And uh, we just, we announced uh, last year, we're now doing another miniseries, Curse of the Green Book, which will be out later in the year. The, is and the Curse Mariana of the Green Fox. Book that your, your well-meaning, mediocre film wins an Oscar? Is that is that what the curse is? <laughs> well, it's funny because with Twisted being an established uh, rap and rock band, one of the things we've done is we've kind of taken twists on the names of different other albums for each of the miniseries. I see. Well, they had an album called The Darkness, so we did The Darkness Rises. They have an album called uh, Green Book from years ago before the, the movie. And uh, so then the next miniseries is The Curse of the Green Book. But yeah, different, uh, very different take on, on that. <laughs> I, I <wouldn't. laughs> and Antonia mm -hmm. is here for the uh, the web series, uh, webcomic Sub-Zero. Yes. Which, did I see right, there are over 80 of those at the moment, 88? Uh, oh, oh well, like chapter episodes? Yeah. Episodes, well, so so far and finished, there's about, there's actually 91 episodes, 92 okay. with episode zero. So yeah, there's 92 episodes now. I yeah. started reading, I have not caught up, but it's delightful. <laughs> It's, oh, it's thank great. you. It's thank great I know it's a lot. Yeah. And you, it's a, it was, it was a lot of content to uh, to consume before I got here. But yeah, it was it was uh, great to look at, and really beautifully, uh, you use the form of web comics very well. Mm -hmm. The, you know, <laughs> the scrolling, oh, the scroll, yeah. Thing, you know, the suspense mm -hmm. of oh wait, what's just below the fold? If I keep, you know, as someone who writes paper mm -hmm. comics, the whole 
page yeah. turn thing is such a, I spend so much time and energy thinking about what's on the page turn. Mm -hmm. And it's, I agree. I think it's like the vertical scroll is very, um, to me, I kind of like it because you almost turn your brain off. So you're, it's just like rectangle panels. But the cool thing is that when you're mo scrolling through, it creates kind of an animation effect. So I guess if you think of it like a camera pan, it can create some really interesting effects. But I know it's a lot of content. I know it, this is two years no, of my it's life. it's great. So. It's really, it's it's an incredibly uh, impressive amount of work. Because I look, you know, I, I looked up your, your uh, I Googled <laughs> you a little bit and I'm like, she's too young to have done this much work. This is a lot of <laughs> work for someone who just got out of college a minute and a half ago mm -hmm, um, yeah. so that's that's very impressive and and yeah the the sparseness of the writing is so intrinsic to the like oh, i gotta keep mm -hmm. rolling i gotta keep going <laughs> you know, I need to, <laughs> yeah. it's very it's very very well paced so i was very uh very impressed with that and uh what when did you start cartooning is this something you've been doing since you were little or so, I mean, I think I've always wanted to do comics ever since I was young, um, but I went to college and I went, to, I studied accounting and then I worked five months in public accounting. And then while doing my comic on the side and I said, at one point after five months, I was like, I'm done. I'm, I'm done. I can't take this anymore. So I basically went and I told them like, hey, I'm quitting. I'm going to go pursue comics full time. And they looked at me kind of funny. But I think after, yeah, it's been, I think it's been almost a little bit over a year since I quit. And I'm just kind of glad that things have turned out well. They told us, they told me like, you can come back after a year if things don't work out. But thankfully, I didn't have to go back. So sure. I'd say, yeah, I am pretty new to comics, but I, I've been doing them for a long time, but I just failed. And this was like the first attempt that actually worked out for me. That's <laughs> incredible. Yeah, I, I, I can honestly say, though, for anyone with a future in any, any version of show business, understanding <laughs> accounting is maybe not a terrible idea. And yeah. I kind of wish I understood it better uh, mm -hmm. than, I, than I do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's helped me a little in like business and like running the comic running as like a you're as an independent uh like contractor almost like it's it's sure. helped me a lot i'd say yeah no my last job before moving to los angeles and getting into the movie business was building furniture in a herman miller factory <laughs> that has not really come up a lot. uh i can i can put it i can put together a chair from ikea probably faster than most but aside from that it's not really useful information. How about how about you Dirk? How did you get involved in uh, in this industry? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's funny actually. Uh, my first series Nightmare World started as an online comic as well back in the early 2000s. We did a much more traditional layout style. We did uh, I posted two pages a week every Thursday. Oh. So it's really cool now what, what's amazing is like with your work especially I'm a huge fan of your work so it's cool to be on screen with you. Mm -hmm. And and to see the evolution of the form, you know, when we started uh, when I started Nightmare World with the artists I worked with, we just did traditional comic book pages. You know, we posted two pages a week on a website. And uh, eventually from there, we got picked up by some smaller publishers, landed at Image Comics, moved over from there to Devil's Due, you know, really embraced the Kickstarter model, you know, and helped, you know, kind of, I guess, get on the ground floor on that as well. And uh, and then and then here we are now, you know, it, it, it's cool, you know, and, uh, you know, have a whole spinner rack of work behind of my own work that's kind of been my life goal you know is like i remember being younger and uh actually i, I got into comics as a teenager and mm -hmm. seeing the spinner racks in the stores and stuff i said man someday it'd be awesome to fill a spinner rack with your own work you know which is what prompted me to move from publishing directly online until then going to print and sure. now working with bands like twisted being nominated for the ringo awards you know and and, and working with source point press it's just it's an amazing journey but it but it started again online how much so you so you come into comics with online comics originally that's fascinating and yeah, 2002 uh, is one of the one of the ogs i guess <laughs> mold yeah, you know, i did i did years. a web series internet filmmaking in 1999 and i was like maybe about five years too early because I didn't even have broadband. I couldn't watch my own movies online. Yeah, you know, so, it, it's funny. It's, I I, uh, I also do a, I did a column, which has now become a book called uh, Right or Wrong, A Writer's Guide to Creating Comics. And I talk about in the book how I was kind of one of those people helping like on the ground floor of the online comic stuff. 
I would have to go to my parents' house to get on their internet to see the work. And it was like literally like when the pages would like, you know, like, dun, 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 you know, like load up mm -hmm. a little bit at a time and stuff like that. So again, now, now to see like the work that you're doing and stuff like that and, and, and with webtoons and everything else, it's just, mm -hmm. it's so cool. It's so cool. And it just, it just makes the work more accessible to everybody. And it's, it's pretty awesome. I'm, I'm curious if both of you or neither of you read, uh, the third Scott McCloud book. Uh, I'm even trying to remember the title of it, Transforming Com Comics, where he actually talks about web comics yeah, and he provides an example very close to your work, Antonia, mm -hmm. of like the the endlessly scrolling, uh, mm -hmm. the endlessly scrolling comic. It's really it's really interesting interesting stuff, mm -hmm. and it has been interesting watching the evolution of that, you know, and watching now. Antonia, have you thought about collecting yourself physically ever? Um, yeah, that? I've I've considered it, and I I actually I for me I really love like tangible things, um, sure. especially like for comics and stuff like that. Like I make little you know merch and stuff, but I've always wanted to have a volume. Um, I think the issue becomes for me personally, it's because because of that vertical scroll, I tend to do so much of it that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it can become difficult for print and it's also in full color. And I tend to use, I'm not like other people who use more like muted um, muted colors. I think my style is more painterly. So mm -hmm. I end up kind of, um, it, it will be very expensive to print. I do want to do it one day, but I think I need to like, I mean, I also want to go back and redraw a bunch of stuff, which is always like, yeah. I think every artist had goes through that. They have to like fight the urge to redraw everything. Um, sure. But I, I do definitely want to do it. And I've seen it's possible. You just have to be more, um, I guess, creative about the way you go about it. Um, yeah, I've seen some where it's like you can take the vertical scroll and you put two per page, like two of the same scroll right. per page and stuff like that. Um, right. But yeah, it's, it's amazing to see how big it's gotten because I, I think like when I was in just in college it was blowing up and now it's gotten like huge like I'm mm -hmm. very impressed by the growth of web comics in the recent years it's you know it blows me away well it's the it's the you know the era that we live in everything mm -hmm. used to be so incredibly expensive to produce mm -hmm. and to right. you know to to print your own comics and you know to use, you know, now you have not only the resources of Kickstarter, but you also, mm -hmm. just, you have printing software, you have art programs, you have all the mm -hmm. filmmaking programs, the cheapness, you know, the fact that my iPhone contains more expensive filmmaking equipment than, you know, you'd walk into a bay 20 years ago and be paying $600 an hour for video mm -hmm. less good than what the messenger app has, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like that's, that's kind of a wild thing. And I think it's the same thing, the sheer, you know, I grew up with comics printed on what by today's standards would be paper <laughs> towels, you know, <laughs> like, and we're all, we've all got our paper towel comics stuffed in plastic, hoping they survive another, another year, but it is, it's an incredible, uh, it's such a different thing to have the tangible object. And I, you know, it's across the board. Digital musicians want to see an album, even though record stores pretty much do not exist anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, filmmakers want to see it projected on a screen and comic book people, comics people want to see it physically. Actually, uh, it occurred to me, you should market your comic as an actual scroll. I was going to say, like, if you print it as a scroll, <laughs> print it on one like, piece of paper, like, a scroll, yeah, scroll, yeah. yeah. it would be incredible. <laughs> I was thinking about, I'm like, what, if I were to print it, would I just have a really long book? Like, would that be, and then the pages would be long? But yeah, I think it's also like, its popularity has to do with how accessible it is. Because I mean, everybody has one of these, you know? So it's, it's sure. at a fingertip away. And it's just, I think that's what also makes it like, um, yeah, like it's growth and popularity. I can't. I can't explain it, honestly. Well, yeah, the whole, you, like you said, the whole world is literally at your fingertips. You know? Yeah, exactly. You can, you can We're all walking it. around with the Library of Alexandria <laughs> in our hands. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, and, and still people will ask you, what is blank on a Facebook post? And you're like, you know, you could ask almost anything. You have a machine in your hands that will answer that question. Yeah, it's like let me Google that for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and Dirk, you, what projects have you used Kickstarter for? 
Oh gosh, um, we the I do a series called Tales of Mystery, which is the the first series I used Kickstarter for. Mm -hmm. uh, we then went on um, the first three volumes of Nightmare World were published by Mitch Comics, and it was always meant to be four. And mm -hmm. what's funny is um, I used to tell a couple of the artists like someday I want to do like an omnibus of like all four books. You know, like Antonio said, I, you know, I'm a book person. I want the thing in my hand. You know. Yep. So one of our biggest campaigns is we did the Nightmare World Omnibus. And because that started as an online comic series, and as Antonio mentioned, you have such a worldwide audience, that Kickstarter blew up to the point where we were able to do like a leather bound, gold gilded pages, ribbon bookmark, mm -hmm. slip case, you know, the whole works. And that, that actually set a record for the publisher that, that stood for a couple of years. Uh, and now from there, like even when we did... Um, we did Haunted High Ons, you know, with Twisted. A lot of their fans don't necessarily have access to comic shops, but they have access to the internet. So while we did the traditional issues, the single issues in comic shops, the direct market, we then did the collected edition initially through Kickstarter. And the result was everyone got a limited edition hardcover with an alternate cover and like some bonus songs from the band and all this cool stuff. So it's really... Kickstarter is a fascinating model. You know, you don't want to overextend it. You don't want to take your audience for granted. But if you can offer a unique artifact or a unique mm -hmm. item, a unique version of the book, while still then also doing a traditional version to support the direct market, it, 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 there, there, there's really room for everybody there. You know, there's room for everybody to eat. It's kind of how I always uh, looked at it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm on my third or fourth or fifth Kickstarter, depending on how you do the math. I'm part of an anthology where yeah. I'm one of, you know, 200 creators on it. And, you know, and Antonio, I was going to ask you, write, you draw. I saw mm -hmm. you have an editor credited, but you're pretty much doing your own thing. Yes. I mean, I have my own team that, like, I think, I mean, in general, like, I think Webtoon, you know, they manage us and they provide editors to help us out. But I think in general, they encourage us to Kind of seek our own talent so <laughs> i hire some of my friends um but like sure. yeah in general I'm, I'm very interested in kickstarter i just want to say because i've i think i've always been um a little bit afraid because i don't know the amount of planning that goes into it for me the the most extent of like crowdfunding that i have is just patreon which is really helpful but i've never i've kind of considered a kickstarter but and i've seen other um webtoon creators that are able to do it and they like for volumes exactly like you say but i've always been a little bit afraid of the amount of planning and like do i need yes. someone to help me or do i need to do yes. it by myself it's a lot <laughs> it yeah is a lot. it is exhausting even just like i've got the two kickstarters running now that i'm involved in i'm not running them i'm you know Dynamite is running one of them. The two editors of the Nightmare Anthology are running another one. And I'm still spending a lot of time doing promotion, doing stuff like this, doing other people's podcasts, doing whatever I can, you know. But it, it seems like you have a built-in audience that would probably mm -hmm. be excited to mm -hmm. have a physical object, a physical version of it. Uh, and you do you sell some swag, right? You have, yes. you have pins, uh, do you have posters, that kind of thing? Yeah, I have posters. I, I mean, I have like little keychains, <laughs> little keychains, stuff like that. But I mean, I so far haven't, I think I've been just so busy with general, like doing this weekly deadline that it's just kind of, um, I don't have a, a lot of time. But now that I'm on a break between like the two seasons, I am going to try to make more merch. Nice. And I think, like I say, I want to have something tangible, Not if not for me, then like for the fans. And sure. You'll never, and, and you're right. You will never work harder than when you do a Kickstarter. I mean, mm -hmm. oh my gosh! It's, you know, mm -hmm. it's not, but, it is, but it's crazy rewarding, and it's yeah. you know, I, I think the while on some level people are like, why should I support you with this? Why not? You know, why not wait till your book comes out in my local comic book store? I think you can, I think you can sell a lot of people on the idea, and you're selling something that's true and honest of like. Do you want me to do this without interference? Do you want me to do the thing as free and clear as an artist with nobody telling me what I can and cannot do? Then support this. If I have to take this to a cult publisher, they may say no to this, no to that. And uh, and that's always 
to me, that's the thing you're selling the audience is here's a thing I created with no interference from anybody, as opposed to here's the thing where the licensor said to me, you can't do that. Spider-Man can't behave that way. You know, whatever it is. And I've been very fu fortunate to have very little uh, dynamite gives me a crazy amount of creative control, which is a beautiful thing, uh, considering I'm dealing with uh, dealing with licensed characters and, in the case of Elvira, someone who is alive, <laughs> you know, and a human being, not a fictional character who reads the scripts and is very, thank God, very happy with them. But Dirk, how is it working with the band? No, how much yeah. do they care? How interested are they? How involved are they? Yeah, it's interesting when we for when I first started working with the band, you know, they um, they were very hands on with the first vibe. I mean, Twisted's a band that's been around for twenty years. Mm -hmm. You know, they're uh, they're really entering that legacy band status and things like that. So, the one of the biggest compliments that I get, and one of the points of most pride I think I have, and and Han and High on, is the fact that their manager George, you know, who I've become good friends with, Huey, says it's incredible that. They never complain about what you do, <laughs> you know, which is really nice. Usually it's very, my, like I said, they're living people. So it's very minor, minor tweaks in the dialogue. Like, oh, you would say it this way instead of this sure. way. But even knowing the guys and hanging out with the guys, you know, you learn their cadence, their speech pattern. But it's sure. usually sure. just like, usually it's just the pejoratives that they throw at each other, like brothers. You know, it's like the only thing that they kind of may occasionally tweak. Sure. But, uh, and it's funny to kind of even loop back to that Kickstarter point you mentioned, when I talk to the guys about how, hey, we could really activate your audience on Kickstarter, even then it was a little bit of trepidation because it is, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of struggle. And the other thing is it's all very transparent. Like you said, sure. you will find out very quickly where people are at. So it's funny, I was able to grab this off the side. And like you said, in the direct market, you could eventually, you can get, I think in a couple months, this trade paperback edition. But through Kickstarter, we offered, hardcover we upgraded it to a you know a double-sided cover and all that stuff so we were able to offer uh people who backed the book on kickstarter bonus swag and bonus stuff which is something that really worked well and played well with the band sure so um even even getting to take them on that journey and then have a very successful campaign with them on that you sure. know we unlocked something like Gosh, I'm trying to wrap up my like 18 stretch goal. I mean, it was just insane. You had to keep sure, sure. adding stuff throughout the campaign because people kept buying in, and it becomes a party. Yeah, so no, it, absolutely, it, it was fun to work with them. And the fan, the fans like to have, you know, it really does give them a feeling of being a part of your thing. And I think honestly, that would work really well with you, Antonia, because I think mm -hmm. there's something a little more intimate about a web comic. Mm -hmm. Like I may be wrong about that, but I feel like the reader has a feels like they have a more uh, a more intimate relationship mm -hmm. with the material um, in a way. And mm -hmm. I think you'd, you'd have a successful Kickstarter. You know, when, I, when I work with Elvira, the funnier thing is that she actually pushes me and the artist Dave Acosta to be more ridiculous and less respectful of her. <laughs> you know, in a way. We had a, yeah. The thing that I'm doing now is called Elvira the Omega Ma'am. And it's a post-apocalyptic Elvira in Los Angeles thing. And she wakes up in a hospital gown in one sequence. And she's like, uh, you don't see my butt in this panel. And I really think you need to see my butt sticking out from under the hospital gown. Um, I was like, really? Are you? Okay, sure. I can. We, can, we can oblige you with a butt shot. I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. So we should wrap up. But Dirk, what do you got coming up? Um, we announced it earlier today, you know, uh, and we talked about previously, Haunted High Ends Volume 2. Uh, the next year's going to be a year of a lot of sequels for me. My second volume of my book on writing, uh, Right or Wrong Volume 2, will be coming out next year. Uh, Hope Volume 2, there's a Haunted High Ends Volume 2, Tales of Mystery Volume 5. Uh, but people go to DirkManning.com, follow me across social media, at Dirk Manning. Um, and we'll see all the stuff coming out. A lot of stuff through SourcePoint Press that I'm just really excited about. Terrific. And Antonia, what do you got? I know more of more of Sub-Zero, but what else? Well, I can, I mean, like I said, this is my first break in two years, so I'm going to sleep <laughs> for a little <laughs> bit. But then, uh, I mean, I definitely want to come back with another like 90 episodes. And then I also, I mean, I have like, a, like I said, a little bit of some merch stuff planned, but I also, I mean, I don't want to give away too much because I'm not sure I can do it, but I'm trying to make this 
tiny little game for my fans that they can uh, like interact with if I if sure. I can say. So um I, yeah, I'm gonna say the the game is a perfect Kickstarter. <laughs> Kickstarter thing. idea, yeah. Kickstarter idea. And I am offering you now as someone who's done a bunch of these things. Reach out to me if you need any help with Kickstarter. Yes, you guide me. Yeah, my my nickel's worth of expertise is yours mm -hmm. for zero cents. So, mm -hmm. uh, thank you both for uh, talking to me. Best of luck tonight at the awards. Mm -hmm. And now I think we're going to bring in Mr. Mark Russell, Star of hey. Stage and Screen. Mark, how are you? I'm so I'm not the only guy wearing a blazer. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure what the dress protocol was, but I figured you could, you never go wrong with the blazer. I I I agree, but we live in a we live in a world of adult men who dress like they dressed in junior high for some reason. Yeah, generally, no, is generally how I dress uh, during COVID. <laughs> um, but sure. uh, but I spiffied up a little bit for for this well, August it, occasion. It is, greatly, it is greatly. I think I'm the only person who started two podcasts during COVID to give me a reason to shave and put on a jacket. Like I I was like. I'm going full Martin Sheen in the first five minutes of Apocalypse Now, very quickly. If I don't, <laughs> if I don't find a focus to the week that you know, I, sh I guess I should take care of this, you know. Right. Yeah. We have to create these sort of artificial oh, totally. uh, means of civilizing ourselves. So otherwise, we'll just all sort of descend back to our hunter gatherer roots. Yeah. Exactly. Hunter gatherers that can call Ralphs for delivery. That's right. The, yeah. That's very, the, not yeah, even the gather. hunter gatherers. Not either. Not even. I use my hunter gather app to have groceries uh, brought to my to my home. It's um, sort of the opposite of hunting gathering because someone yeah. brings it, then you have to put it all away. It's like <laughs> yeah, the, right. the like hunter disperser or something. It's the disperser into your pantry. Right. Uh, congratulations on being nominated on a Ringo. Oh, thanks. Um, and it's not specifically tied to Second Coming, but that's. This is what you had this year, right? Second Coming yeah. and Wonder Twins. Those are and probably the two biggest titles of 2020 that I that I wrote. Um, and and yeah, they, um, I'm really honored to be nominated for both of them for different awards, and then for the for the writer award, which is you know just tickles me pink considering how many awesome writers there are oh, out yeah. there. No, it's it's especially it's, 2020. There was so many really just. I would. I, I was. I couldn't swing a cat and and not hit a great comic in you know yeah. the comic book store. It was crazy there how many, how much good stuff there was. Oh yeah, we are we are undoubtedly in a golden age. I would say that what comics are doing now is similar to the revolution in television the last ten years of uh, treating viewers like adults and also marketing properly to children <laughs> as well. Not you know. Yeah. Right. It's not all. That. But yeah, I think there's really good stuff being made across the board for every demographic. And I think yeah. that a lot of it is that comics are starting to realize that they're the um, the medium in which you can take chances. Yeah. Because yeah. it is a relatively low investment compared to like yeah. a movie or a TV show. So why not make something interesting? Why not make something that you, you wouldn't necessarily see on TV or in a movie? Right. And, and take some chances with the medium where that's one of the few mediums where that's still like a real possibility. Absolutely. And speaking of taking chances, let's talk about Second Coming, uh, which is a you know it's a it anytime you want to write about uh, anyone's Messiah, be it Superman or Jesus Christ, it's a it's a risky thing. And I noticed you have an interest in religion going all the way back in your work. Uh, I think yeah. the first time I saw your name was on that great project with uh, our mutual friend. Oh yeah, whose coffee cup I chose uh, this morning. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, my but I drink first it most published book, and also my first foray into comics, in a way, was uh, that book, God is Disappointed in You, which is a retelling of the Bible. Every book of the Bible condensed down to three or four pages with cartoons by Shannon Wheeler, um, New Yorker cartoonist, creator yeah. of Too Much Coffee Man, who you just. Uh, yes, we just had, showed a little. Showed, showed Shannon on your Shannon but, is uh, a good guy. Yeah, Wheeler. and it was published by Top Shelf. So that was sort of like, <laughs> you know, my first sort of introduction to comics like this might be an industry that i want to work in this might be a medium that resonates well with what i have to say but yeah I, i've been i think we as writers write about the things that sort of wound us mm -hmm. and you know my my religious upbringing has been something i've been trying to exercise from my mind for the last 30 years something i've been trying to come to terms with so i think that's what we write about we don't write about 
what we know so much as we write about what haunts us. <laughs> and um, and so, yeah, yeah it, it's become a pervasive theme, even in works which are not ostensibly about religion. Well, sure. I mean, I, you know, I was going to say that's the, you know, you write about the things that wound you and part of the, I wouldn't even say the job of the writers because it's a, it's a reflex. We honestly can't help it. No matter what, if I came to you tomorrow and said, you're writing the Fantastic Four, those issues of the Fantastic Four would be about you. Like yeah, they would I think, be about your experiences. They would be about your feelings about the world. They would be about the things that haunt you. I think one of the things that, you know, keeps superhero comics relevant, despite the fact that, you know, there's only so many, you know, tag teams and matchups that you can do in superhero comics. The thing that, that I think still keeps people coming back, uh, aside from the, you know, the uh, PG-13 violence, is the fact that they are all essentially thought experiments. Like, well, if I had this power, how would I use right. it? If right. uh, if I if I didn't care about the norms and laws of society, how would I abuse them? Uh, you know, what would I do as a villain? Uh, they're these these great thought experiments. So it's a, it's I think that really any sort of comics genre is is amenable to talking about ideas and to talking about the things that sort of like you you know really weigh on you as a as a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I mean, and you know, when you talk about superheroes as a thought experiment. Everything you need to know is in microcosm with the fact that when they created Superman, he was a villain, and then they retooled him as a hero because they they thought, no, let's let's go another way. Instead of him becoming the all power dictator of the world because no one can stop him, what if he was nice? Yeah, <laughs> you know? I think a, a, a lot guy? of what what you know superheroes are represented, and what I think we try to do as writers of comics is to like provide an antidote to what's currently going on in the world. So I think that's why Superman became such a huge hit in 1938, 1939, was that he was an antidote to the rise of fascism and Nazism. That's why he was so much more relevant as a hero than as a villain, because people didn't need uh, right. a, a villain with, with you know, um, awesome powers. They, they, that was, they could that was see happening. that in the newspaper yeah. every day. What they needed was an antidote to that. What they needed was somebody to represent uh, hope against the, the the world as they saw it. And I think that's a lot of what I try to write in my comics too, is like, what's what's the antidote to the, uh, what's destroying the world as, as we know it? Hope is a, there's a quote from Fellini that I always try to remember when I'm writing. Uh, he said that happy endings are a cruel practical joke to play on an audience because they will go out into the world and happy endings will be few and far between. He also said that downer endings are kind of a cop out for almost the same reason. He said a hopeful ending is the best gift you can give an audience. And you right. can see it in all of his movies. And, you know, I'll do a happy ending with the best of them. But uh, but I, I always kind of remember how powerful hope is in art and how transforming it is and how I'm sure you can think of a thousand examples. I can think of a thousand examples where a piece of art rewrote your brain for a day or a minute or for your life yeah and i think that the key is not to like leave people with like a manifesto where it's like okay this is what needs to be done right so much as like the sense that yeah I, well, I, there there is something i can do yeah well there, and i always think as far as I'm like a giving them a manifesto the to me the best villains uh have a point you listen yeah. to them and you go well you're going about solving this in the worst possible. I'm doing this post-apocalyptic thing right now, this ridiculous thing called Elvira the Omega Ma'am. And I rewrote, and it, I connect in my head, I connected the COVID to the plague that destroys the world and that. A lot of laughs, you know, plague humor That's right now. Like, yeah. But, uh, but the villain in the Omega Man, I had I watched it again recently, Matthias. First off, a certain amount of prescience that the post-apocalyptic cult is run by a guy who was a TV news anchor. That like the last person people saw on TV during the apocalypse is who they appoint as the, there seems to be an echo of that going on. But uh, also he says, you know, technology, technological man brought this on. The world ended because of all of this, because of the wheel, because of the machines. And you go, you're a Luddite nut, but also, yes, <laughs> you know, the world yeah, did well, it in that movie. It's a chemical war thing, but it's like, also, yes. 
you know. I think that yeah, the the history of human uh, civilization is like solving the the challenges to our survival. You know, it's like oh, food is scarce because you know caribou run away and and there's only so many nuts and berries in the shrubs before you eat them all. Right. So you create agriculture, and then oh, right. food is scarce because we've had so many people, uh, and and we don't really have a way to like feed and clothe and move them all around to places where there is more like land to be tilled. So, oh, we create industrial revolution so we can move people around and we can create like uh, other things for them to do other than farming. And, you know, we're, at some point we just sort of became our, the own biggest threat to our civil, to our survival. Right. It's like we've right. solved the big problems of human survival. And if we wanted to, we could provide a, a, like a comfortable existence to pretty much everybody on the planet. But uh, the, I think on some intrinsic level, because we are wide-eyed hunter gatherers at, you know, at evolutionary heart, that seems boring to us. Right. So we, we had to create the threat that we need to survive. Right. We had to become like the, the, the tiger that we um, fear in, at night in the cave. Right. And, uh, and it's a shame that we, we haven't evolved past the point of, needing of like needing that 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 sense of threat to survive right. that we can't well, just enjoy I, it you know it, i think it's worth noting that you know star trek is always held up as a very optimistic piece of work and it is and it imagines the future of humanity in original star trek it was made very clear that civilization was almost destroyed by a nuclear global war in the 90s <laughs> <laughs> and it's very yeah. nice that that didn't happen, but even the most optimistic view of the future Gene Roddenberry could come up with in 1966 was, well, after we get that third world war out of the way, things will be better. <laughs> right. There's a reason why, you know, this sort of quasi-utopian social democracies of Western Europe and Scandinavia came about in the ashes of World War II. Right. It's, it's like people realized that there, you know, there's got to be a better way that, that we, um, now that the, the old order has been destroyed, we owe it to everyone who comes after us to build something better, to right. learn from the mistakes well, of the past. I, I don't know if this is still true. I remember it from reading about the post-war period in Japan, but Japan's constitution is more liberal than ours in many ways. Oh, I'm sure. Because it was written by a bunch of MacArthur's secretaries literally <laughs> like said okay here's the u.s constitution we're gonna make the japanese constitution a little better than ours uh out of and they were willing to listen because of what they had been through i mean not to get off on a tangent but i always right. you know the looking at the example of europe and fascism and world war ii and where all of those countries are at now you go maybe sherman should have burned georgia a little harder <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you know, I maybe, wouldn't say that, but um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you, know, you need to have the ashes upon which to rebuild. You sometimes, yeah, if an institution yeah. survives, it just continues to get more outdated. Sometimes you yeah. do need like like a good starting over point. Yeah, you, know, you need there, well, you I need mean, a, my, a meteor to destroy the dinosaurs. A, a good a good Nuremberg in 1965 in 1865 might have helped a little bit more instead of just. Oh, we'll forget everything you guys just did. <laughs> We're just going to try and like move forward as brothers. I think every once in a while, the you know the hammer does need to fall on. Like, no, that was treason. <laughs> you know, uh, I think that the, these periods of great distress, like sort of like what we're going through now, also uh, kind of create like the greatest sort of air of hope because yeah. it's like you feel like, well, we've we've survived this far. We've we've taken the worst. And we can, and we know the consequences of not acting. And I think that's what what hope really is: is the the sense that not only is there something better out there, but the feeling that we we can build it, the feeling that it can be done. And I feel like like a, that that's sort of the the sense, even though I, you know, there's a there's a pandemic, and we're saddled with the most corrupt and inept administration of this country's history. Uh, I feel like there's the sense that that that. We can fix this. That that, yeah. that we can make the world better than it would have been had this never even happened. Yeah. No. It's a. I know a lot of people who have struggled struggled with hope the last four years with having any of it or with attaching hope to things that really right. weren't gonna make the world a better place. We've right. all hope, been, hope is the cousin of disappointment. You know. Yeah. Exactly. And it's uh, you know, and it's again, it's in times like this that we do really turn to the art. Uh that got us through the last time. I mean, one of the first things I wrote in, 
you know, 2015, 2016 was like, there's a stock character in movies about the 1930s and movies made in the 1930s of the Jewish guy at the Berlin cocktail party going, no, this is going to be really bad. And everybody kind of laughing at him. And right. I'm like, be that guy. Be the be the be the guy who won't stop talking about Hitler at your Berlin 1930s cocktail this, party. This is the thing you should remember whenever anyone uh, sort of accuses you of being Cassandra, because that Cassandra was always right. Yeah, I know that's always kind of a funny. Like Her prophecies of doom were always borne out. So yeah. it's like, no, it is it is a it is a funny. It's funny to me when people lose the context of things that they're quoting. Right, point they think they're making. The number of people who will quote. A uh, number of people who will quote Polonius's "To thine own speech, to thine own self be true" speech without going no, but in in the play he's an idiot. <laughs> like and and Shakespeare saying this is all very facile, shallow advice. And when people repeat it with great emotion, I'm like, yeah, okay, that's you know, good. If, if it works for you, it works. If Polonius is the guy you want to take advice from, that's that's fantastic and good luck. It's the same thing with, uh, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Uh, that was the first half of the aphorism that that, that Christ gave. The, the second half was, uh, but I say, you know, turn the other cheek. Or, and if you, um, and if you, you know, if your um, neighbor asks you for a cloak, give them two. Right. It, you know, it's like people remember the first part because it's, it's like it resonates more with the reptile brain. Yeah. We should be yeah. able to be like plucking out eyes and teeth. Yeah, it's like, and that is literally the opposite of the message. It's like, it reminds me of uh, in the Jefferson Memorial, there's an etching of a famous quote of his on the wall that says, you know, I will stand against uh, all tyranny uh, that seeks to enslave the human heart. Something like that. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. The first half of the sentence, which they have chopped off, was, though all the clergy may stand against me, comma. <laughs> I'm like, that's kind of an important piece of context about whose tyranny he is specifically upset about here. He's not actually talking about King George in that sentence. Uh, he's talking about something far more fascinating and pernicious and all of those things. What what was your religious upbringing, if I may ask, that led to this haunting? Well, I, I grew up like a lot of Americans in a very conservative evangelical household uh, where, you know, and it's since convinced me that the, the more you think the Bible is meant to be taken literally, uh, the less you actually understand the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel like like it, it, for a long time, it, you know, after I left my religion, I was, was sort of just scarred by the Bible. And I wanted nothing to do with it. And so in a lot of ways, writing the book uh, that I made with Shannon kind of disappointing. It was therapeutic because it helped repair my relationship to the Bible mm -hmm. because I realized the, the, the Bible is actually a, a wonderful book. It's a great document of like 66 different writers trying, struggling with what it was they thought God wanted from them. And mm -hmm. in many ways, very profound. Uh, it, it just wasn't taught well. You know, yeah. it, what I had learned was the one percent that was useful to whoever was teaching Sunday school or to whoever was trying to get me to like shut up and not have sex. You know, and yeah. um, and taken within the context of like the what it was trying to do historically and what people were trying to the it was a silent prayer for redemption for people who were on the verge of conquest, usually on the mm -hmm. verge of being destroyed by by other empires or or who had themselves like just conquered a piece of land and you know were looking for signs that this was the right thing to do. And so the the actual Bible is you know much more I think has a lot more to say to us and it and it has a lot of different things to say. And a lot of it is like you know an argument about what it is God wants from yeah. people. And uh, to me like this has been uh, that process was really rehabilitative because it, it allows me to like see that there there are also valuable things in the the tradition and the, that I came from. I just wasn't really allowed to have them when I was young. Sure. Well, in the you know in the the Old Testament, as it's called, coming out of the Jewish tradition, Judaism was all about arguing over what's in that <laughs> book. Like, there's no tradition of like. Well, I shouldn't say that. There is a tradition of all of this means exactly what it says, and we shouldn't argue about it. But larger There's, Judaism yeah. writ large is let's get together and talk about what's in this book endlessly. And uh, but I think your book is very valuable 
because it 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 needs to be boiled down. It's a dense text. Yeah. Not everybody. Well, I think the other thing it does, in addition to condensing it, is it like sort of gives you some historical context because you you might turn the page and all of a sudden somebody, somebody's yelling about the Malachites. Because right. for ancient audiences, they just assumed, oh, you you know who the Malachites are, you know what they've they've been up to, but for modern readers, they don't know who the right. Malachites are or why they're the uh, like Obadiah is upset at them. So by including the context, you include the meaning. Like you were saying, it's like if you if you put the Thomas Jefferson quote on the wall, but you divorce it from, you know, who he's talking to, it right. doesn't really you don't really understand what he was saying. Yeah, and changes, the same is true of the Bible. The you don't understand. Yeah who they were talking to and what you know was causing them to have this reaction you don't really understand the bible yeah yeah no con context is it and again the people who the people will tell you that the current their copy of the king james in paperback is the inerrant word of god you just go this is a game of telephone that's between five and two thousand years old uh right. It's been you've, you're reading a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation by people who had a lot of stake in how what you read was being interpreted. And uh, I don't and I don't think that devalues it. I mean, no. uh, it, it's great to be able to read something that old and find valid meaning of it like thousands of years later. By all means, you know, do it. Uh, just just keep in mind that's what you're doing. You're taking yeah. something that was not written for you that was not written with like. Southern Baptists in the year 2020 in mind, in, right. it was written for people of that time dealing with the things they're going for, going through, and you know, take having having that understanding. If you can find things that apply to your life, that's great. Yeah, no, and it also shows the power of a metaphor 5,000 years old to still be resonant and still tell you something. Yeah, in a way, it's kind of reassuring when I read the Bible or when I read uh, like the histories of Herodotus or other sort of ancient texts, it, in all the ways that we are still so very similar to ancient peoples. Yeah. The same way we we worry about uh, you know our place in the universe and you know or how what our what our families are going to be going through after we're gone and these sort of metaphysical uh, anxieties we have are not new. In a way, it gives me like some hope that they're that they're not maybe as bad as, right. as I think they are because we've always had them. Yeah, no, everyone, every age has struggled with them. And sometimes you do read things in old texts where, uh, you know, I think Fellini's version of Satyricon is a great example of what's one of the best period films ever made because the psychology of the characters appears alien. When you, like, it's not merely that it's this ancient text what they think about and what they care about and their priorities are a little like, that is, I barely understand why those characters are behaving with that way. So there is, there can right. be, there can be changes in it and there is an ebb and flow to it. Um, but the eternal questions are the eternal questions and you can't, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think that's, that's the key is that like, you know, society and our institutions change radically over the years. But we, as like human beings, have so, we're still sort of hunter gatherers. We're still sort of the same elemental creatures that we were, yeah, forty, it's, fifty thousand years ago. It's, it's all how close you got to the monolith and did you touch it or not, right? <laughs> For how much you learned. Uh, what have you got coming up? I got to wrap up. Uh, oh, uh, well, the trade paperback for Billionaire Island comes out in November. So I'm very excited by that. Uh, with the foreword by Brian Michael Bendis. Nice. Uh, also, you probably also heard that I'm going to be doing uh, the uh, Imperious Lex story for the the DC Future State line. Uh, three that issues. sounds great. Yeah, it's about uh, Lex Luthor running his own planet uh, called Lexor. Uh, where he is like worshipped and Superman is like seen as the, the biggest sure. villain on sure. the planet. And th those are the two things which have been announced. So, uh, and also second coming, the second season starts in December. Oh, great. I can't wait. That's a great book. Uh, well, Mark, thank you so much for talking to me. I knew that we would barely talk about comic books if the <laughs> two of us uh, got into a conversation and there would be more theology and history. Uh, but it's been very illuminating and fun. Yeah, yeah, I had a great time, David. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir, and good luck tonight. And up next, I believe we have coming in Mr. Julian Glander. Hey, David. Julian. hey, how's it going? 
Going great. Nice to meet you. Ah, you too. What your a place, treat. Your place looks very nice. Oh, I, I spent all morning getting it, uh, you know, <laughs> beautified. Right. Just yeah. just here. If I turn the cam if I turn the computer one degree, it's piles of garbage. Piles of garbage. It's a complete disaster. And yeah. you also I, I bought a really attractive microphone for podcasting and it's just it never gets on camera. I, like, yeah, well I I, I have like, a swivel mount here for my little fuzzy they, gamer mic. It's yeah. really it's really nice. I'm but, invested in Zoom because it's not going anywhere. Right. So you're up for best presentation in graphic design. Is that correct? Am I uh, that right? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I personally I think you should the award should be uh, best ability to convince a publisher to physically produce something really difficult. <laughs> you're, you're not going to believe this, but it, none of this was even my idea. They really? completely. I I started talking to Eric at Fanographics about doing a book, and I said, mm -hmm. "Oh, you know, it'd be really cool if it was like an orange square with just a big face on it." And and I thought, like, okay, this is going to be hard. We're going to go through a hundred iterations to find the cover. And he was like, "Okay, let's do it." And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I I thought I'd have a little more <laughs> work to do here. And then it was actually, it was their idea to do the squishy. Really? Uh, That's Yeah, it's great. And I mean, I, I got the book and there's this, I don't know if I can even see it on camera, but they, they got like a purple binding in here. Nice. Uh, they, they did all this really cool stuff with it. I, I didn't have to push for it at all. It's just like, that That's what they do that's with really graphics. Great. And a, yeah, that's a, I mean, they have a great storied history in independent yeah. comics and all that. So it's, I shouldn't be surprised, but when I saw it physically, I was just like, wow, I can't imagine a publisher being very excited about paying to print that cover with that physical texture and all of that. I think you got to give people something a little special. Oh, it's, yeah. and it's a, it's a startling design. It's a, yeah. it is eye catching. I mean, you know, award, award notwithstanding, it, it is. <laughs> You know, it is really, uh, and is this, is this your, this isn't your first physical collection, or is it? It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you you started out uh, doing web stuff. Yes. Correct? Yes. Uh, not not an ongoing web comic, but a series of individual things? It was, um, it was a couple different things there. Were, most, of, most of what's in the book was published on Vice, uh, and it was yeah. first, first I had an ongoing series called Please Look at Me. Where I couldn't, I couldn't decide on a theme or a topic or a set of characters, so I did a different setup every week. Uh, and then after doing that for a couple months, uh, there's a series in here called Purple Slime Molds, and it's about these little blob guys that are chit chatting each other. Uh, and then my final project with Vice was a an ongoing series called Susan Something. Uh, and it's about this young woman who is uh, a gamer. Nice. Uh, and then there's there's also some kind of miscellany stuff that I did for random websites or just for Instagram. Yeah. Nice. And and uh, did you do cartooning offline before you started doing it online? I mean, As you look young enough that there was no online er offline era. Wow, anymore. thank you. That is true. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, as, as a kid, I was really into comics. And I, when I was, you know, in high school, I completely forgot about it and never really did, gave the idea of being a cartoonist any thought. I just thought, it's so daunting. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I started doing these about five years ago um, after I'd already been developing a practice as an illustrator and animator and, and game designer, sort of where, as an offshoot of that. Where were you working as an animator and uh, game designer, if I can ask? <laughs> In my house. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean, for what company for what, uh, or project? Um, I guess uh, at that time, I was doing a lot of animated GIF commissions for like brands, for like okay. Subway Sandwiches or through Giphy. Or, um, and now what I do is illustrations for the New York Times, and I work for Cartoon Network on nice. little projects here and there, and Adult Swim, yeah. Nice. That's that's amazing, and it's and it's you know it's it's great looking stuff. It's you have a you have a really great style. Do you work with digital tools exclusively? Yeah, uh, it's kind of funny. I'm really not much of a drawer, um, and so I by the time I was 20 years old, I just as assumed that a career in art was not for me because I had been told since I was a kid that I really didn't have it. 
Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, working in 3D, it's completely different. It's like, sure. it's a, it's like a mixture of a lot of different disciplines. It's kind of like sculpting. It's, it's kind right. of like, it feels like playing a video game, you know, like, I think a lot of people who do 3D, they have an innate understanding of it from like Minecraft and the Sims, uh, and just like moving in that world. Yeah. It is, it is funny what all of the things we have done with computers from whatever age we get involved in them are training us to do one thing. Oh, I know. Other. If I had known, I would have, you know, I would have picked something else, obviously. Uh, <laughs> I'd be like working at NASA now if I could. Yeah. I wanted, to, you know, I was born in 1965, so I wanted to be an astronaut. And at the time, my eyesight precluded that, so... Yeah. Uh, well, I, now I, they got I, they probably got all kinds of fixes for that. Yeah. You know, I, now just yeah. some space contacts. Your number of mathematicians they've sent into space. I I have a feeling that there have been a few guys with glasses up there. A few few people with glasses up there. Imagine point. how limited the pool would be if they couldn't couldn't send oh, yeah. any eggheads up there. Right. Exactly. We we want the smartest people in the world, but no one who wears glasses. <laughs> He really narrows it down. down. That's uh, that's why it was all fighter pilots at the beginning. People with incredible vision and great reflexes, and that was the prime thing they were looking for. But uh, uh, what's your next project? What do you have coming up? Um, let me think. I'm finishing up a bunch of stuff. I've spent all year working on this project for HBO Max. That I I don't even know how much I'm allowed to say about it. It's like a it's a special episode of a kids TV show that they have on HBO Max. That's done. It's usually a 2D show and it's done in 3D. Um, and next week I have a little short thing coming on Adult Swim, and I just started working on a kids book with an author that I'm really excited about. And again, I don't think I'm allowed to talk I'm about it. Not sure it. you can say the name. I probably could. It's Julio Torres. Oh, but, that's great. Um, yeah, it's that's it's gonna be really fun. I hope I hope nobody legally powerful is watching this right now. It's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna have a red dot on me in a second, like <laughs> on the higher power. Yeah, it is it is a tricky it is a funny thing. I was I was working in what I thought was secret on the development of the Red Sonia movie that's currently Oh nice. Out. And I was like, Oh, I can't talk about this. And uh, at one point I said, you know, you guys should uh talk to Gail Simone because she's a really great resource on Red Sonia. And like an hour later on Twitter, I saw Gail saying, oh my God, I just talked to Joey Soloway about Red Sonia. <laughs> well, I guess I can, I, I guess uh, Gail's got a few more Twitter followers than I do. Yeah. I, bet, I, I guess I can say that I was in that room and doing there's that. No, there's no rules on this stuff anymore. It is a little, it is a little tricky, and the you know the the enforceability of some NDAs and the yeah. You know, I have been I have been chided so many times for oh posting. really. Well, I'm a big poster, you know. Right. I post I, anytime something happens, I'm posted about it. So it's just a numbers game, really. Yeah. No, it's a, but it it does just like ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time when you do that, you are advertising their project. Right. It's exactly like, if you don't post. Then it's yeah. like you get an email like, "Can you post? Yeah, it's, can you it, hype this up and yeah. tag us in it?" Yeah, it's literally just a control mechanism of like, you didn't do it when we asked you to, yeah. in, the way, in the way that we asked you to do it. So, uh, but yeah, because I love posting works in progress from artists. Yeah. I mean, I always check with the artist first to say, "Is this done enough for me to show the world?" You know, and every once in a while, I get out. Eh, let me tighten those pencils up a little uh -huh. bit before I do this, uh, but. Most of the time, you know, you're just building hype, and there's right because what's the worst thing that could happen? Right, somebody exactly. steals your idea and gets it put out before you. Good luck. Right. Yeah, and, I, and, and also, I'm the writer. I'm not. I, I promise, I am not posting spoilers. I promise. Yeah. Like, I'm not. I'm not undermining my own work by going and here's the last page. It's like, <laughs> no. uh, I I promise I won't do that. But uh, but yeah, and in this day, I said this earlier this hour that like. 50% of your work as a creative artist is the creative art, and the other 50% is all of this, what we're doing here. Oh, you I'd know? say it's like 90% that. It, it's it, like, it, I'd it, like you know, it to be 50%. It, it can definitely ramp up. I can't remember what movie star said it, but it was like, they give me $20 million a movie, and that's a lot of money. I would do the movie for free. I need the $20 million to go on the press tour. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I need to, to, to make me feel good about the press tour. <laughs> Well, um, I like doing this stuff, especially I, this year. 
when there's yeah. just nothing going on. Oh yeah. This is like, this is great because it gave me a reason to know what day of the week it was. Right. Like, I got the Ringo's on Saturday. Right. No, I just told Mark Russell that I, I'm the person who I started two weekly podcasts this year. Nice. And it's literally because I have a lot of suits in my closet. <laughs> and uh, if, and I'd like to go, I don't want to go 365 days wearing t-shirts. That's not my style. So this gives me an excuse to shave and put on a jacket. And, uh, you know, I always say I go from, when I'm idle, I go from zero to Martin Sheen in the first five minutes of Apocalypse Now. Very quick. <laughs> oh, I know. I, I'm Very my, quickly with I'm the whiskey my, bottle uh, and the mirror punching. And let's not, let's just not do that. That, we're all doing it this year. I'm in my yeah. pajamas today, but the I, I want to say that these are my nice pajamas. They are so, very nice pajamas. They look yeah. like they, they're not too wrinkly. Not yet. But, yeah, uh, they've got it. They've got an actual collar on them. Imagine if I had ironed this this morning. I'd be like that would be insane. Best dressed at the at the Zoom Awards. <laughs> that would that would be insane. Yeah, no, I I said to someone the other day, if you came up to me a year ago and said next year you will start two podcasts, my answer would have been does the world end? And I actually would have been right. Yeah, well. <laughs> I would have been a little bit right with that. Uh, well, we've hit noon, which is the time at which I'm supposed to hand it over to someone else. I don't know if anybody's standing by, but uh, thank you so much for uh, talking to me, Julian. Thank it was you. an absolute was really pleasure uh, meeting you and uh, best of luck tonight at the awards. Thank you, I'll see you there. Ciao. I'm supposed to be handing this over to another host. I don't know if I am. Am I? Control room. This isn't really dancing. Uh, this is a good time to once again uh, pimp Shannon Wheeler's uh, Too Much Coffee Man mug, which I'm out of coffee now. You know, I would take a... Okay, something else is going to happen. Thanks for joining me. Thank you.